going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Bro History at Henry Zamoda and Danny Deljabar. What's up, my friend? How are you? Chilling, man. As per usual. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty well now that I'm talking to you again. Um, it's mm-hmm. been two weeks. How was your trip to Texas? It was really awesome. Um, I want to first start out by saying, you know, I went down to uh, do a wedding. It was for my girlfriend's sister and her now husband. Um, and when I arrived in Texas and we went on uh, my girlfriend's parents' property, so uh, her dad, who's probably listening to this right now, um, greeted me with a handshake. And I said, hey, how, how's it going? He, and he replied to me, chilling, man, as per usual. <laughs> <laughs> that's fun. So that's a mark of a true uh, bro history uh, fan there, which I thought was awesome. Shout out to you. Um, my girlfriend's... But- my girlfriend's uh- uh, dad once with all of his buddies like we were at a party and he's like hey henry come here so tell us did assad gas his own people <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, so it, it was it was a fun trip um but but the wedding honestly was the highlight of that um and i had arguably the most interesting wedding story ever uh for those who are listening that that don't already know um i am a wedding officiant i've performed i guess at this point not sure if it's 10 or 11. I I lose count after a while, but I've performed several weddings. Um, Many of them have been traditional. I've done, you know, uh, small weddings, big weddings. Reverend Abdul-Jabbar. Minister, actually. Uh, (laughs) And um, this one was, I got to say, the the most wild one. And I've done a toga-themed wedding on a llama ranch. So this one... um, was actually the second time that I married the same couple. So we, we did a small COVID wedding back in October, which was just live streamed. There wasn't almost anybody there. Um, and we did the traditional vows and all that other stuff. And that was, and that was fine and good, but they never got the, uh, uh, wedding certificate, like the official documentation at the time, because it was COVID and it was kind of a pain in the ass. So, uh, they finally got it. And this time around, instead of doing a traditional ceremony, they decided to do like a contract signing ceremony, kind of like signing the document, you know, the official legal document. And they both happen to be wrestling fans, so much so that they're actually going on a a wrestling cruise, a wrestling theme cruise for their honeymoon. Uh, I forget when that happens, but that's going to be interesting. And uh, the bride, she actually had um, kind of an awesome idea, which was to reenact a 20-year-old contract signing from the WWF, uh, between Stone Cold Steve Austin and Triple H uh, for like a, a matchup that was going to take place for WrestleMania. And it, <laughs> I mean, I showed you the video. Um, it was ridiculous. Uh, we roped off, literally with rope, made it look like a wrestling ring. We put a table down and everything. And, you know, I'm going through my lines and I'm literally reenacting what Vince McMahon said word for word uh, with the exception of like the people's names and the dates and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, you know, they come out and there's like intro music, just like Stone Cold's intro music and like Triple H's intro music. And it was hilarious. And then, you know, spoiler alert, uh, they go to sign the contract and the bride, uh, ends up taking a steel briefcase and hitting the the groom over the head and like, does this like ridiculous thing, even pedigrees him into the ground, which was absolutely hilarious. And it, it worked out flawlessly. I mean, what did, what was your reaction when you saw that video? Dude, that was nuts. Um, that's Texas for you, right? Yep. (laughs) I think that's the only place that would have something like that going on. Yeah, that was crazy. Um, I've never seen anything like that at a wedding in my entire life where they reenacted a very, very important part of history, the uh, WW, the WrestleMania contract signing between Steve Austin and Stone Cold Steve Austin and Triple H. And your Vince McMahon wasn't bad. You just got to fire someone. You're fired! You're yeah, suspended without you. pay for six months! <laughs> You're fired! It was awesome. It was awesome. Definitely one of the most, you know, memorable weddings I've done. And I've done a lot of really good ones, too. So. Jesus, man. You should just make a business out of doing the most absurd weddings ever. Well, hit us up online if you're looking for Danny from Bro Reverend, to Reverend Danny. Minister. <laughs> if you Reverend want me to do it, better. I can do it in sounds all 50 like a... states. So just uh, hit us up. <laughs> if you wanted the most absurd wedding that you can possibly think of, um, red weddings. what was your what was your idea again the, um, that you dress up like um, link from Zelda to do I'm, our eventual wedding I'm down 
uh, I'll get a uh, I'll get the whole get up and well I, I I've already the the lady has already objected to that unfortunately there, there will be no link costume well maybe we, we could have, do something a priest, in the, a priest in the reception is, a priest <laughs> is going to marry us a man of God well maybe in the reception we can do something fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll try to talk her into it. I don't think. I think she's pretty set on the traditional way of doing a wedding. But um, all right, let's go. Let's start. Let's start talking. Um, right. yeah, and about enough real avoiding stuff. It's the been subject. Two, it's been two. It's been two weeks, <laughs> and uh, man, it's been a while since we've taken a week off from doing an episode. And little did you know, when we take that week off. Uh, shit, shit pops down. off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, things start to happen, um, and it almost seems like the Israel-Palestine conflict is the axis that the world turns around. Sometimes, so when something happens there, it's it's a uh, it's a uh, you know everyone has something to say uh, in in this world, and you know what what I've experienced over the past two weeks because I've been very engaged in the news cycle um first time in a long time actually <laughs> yeah it's been over we've the been past taking a week. break for the from from the news yeah it is i think a mistake that a lot of people make on our side on our point of view on this is that we can you define our side sorry i just want to make sure i'm following you um i am, am sympathetic towards the palestinian cause and um, I changed my mind on that. Like this was something that I came to the con- conclusion probably about five or six years ago. Um, most of my life, I have been very, very uh, pro the Israeli side of the narrative. So I just want to be uh, upfront on you know where my perspective come from comes from. But I think that what happens a lot is that when someone is trying to explain this to someone who doesn't really know that much about the information or know that much about the conflict that's going on is that, um, you know, we try to like be like, Hey, you should know this already. And you're just ignorant. If you don't, if you don't even know like the facts on the ground and you mm-hmm. kind of put people in, and, and you're kind of off putting doing that. And I was having a conversation with my girlfriend and she was asking me, my girlfriend doesn't really follow this stuff. She doesn't really care about this stuff. Um, she was asking me like, what's going on there? Like what's going on with Israel, Palestine, and, you know, I kind of went into the default rhetoric of, well, people are going to tell you it's complicated, but it's not complicated. This is a very easy thing to understand. Mm-hmm. And I was like, it all starts back in the 1800s with Theodore Herschel. <laughs> and she's like, Henry, stop, stop. Like, you just said this wasn't complicated. And it is clearly complicated because you're going all the way back to the 1800s to try to explain this. And yeah, I'm like, and I'd, I'd even argue you can go back thousands of years in this yeah. particular point. Yeah. So there's like this. I think that people um, who are you know really into politics and stuff like that, they get this weird sense of uh, like, hey, I know something that you don't know, and it makes me smarter and more informed. And I really think that's not a good habit to be in. Yeah. Um, I think it puts people off more so than anything else because. It's not people's fault that they don't really know about the Israeli-Palestine conflict. It's not people's fault at all because it takes a lot of time to follow this stuff. And frankly, Americans are overworked. Um, You know, they're more concentrated on just like, you know, what they're doing with their family, within their community, and and things like that, rather Mm -hmm. than following international politics. I'd I'd extend that to just more than just uh, Americans, but people all over the world. And and I can sympathize with that, too. I mean, you're, you know, just to declare my stated positions here before we get started, um, I'm... Um, I am half Palestinian and half Puerto Rican, but I was raised by my mother uh, as a Catholic, and I didn't know my Palestinian side for many years, so I I really didn't have a, you know, a a deep connection with Palestine, and and as you know, we don't really get taught this stuff in school, so I really didn't have very much of an opinion on it until I started, you know, going to college and learning a little bit more about, you know, history, uh, specifically German history, uh, because that's, you know, uh, you know, Holocaust studies is a big, you know, topic in German in German studies, and you know the offshoot of that is is of course Zionism, um, which you know uh, uh, you know comes naturally as a studying point. And the more I ended up studying it as a you know um, you know as, as a student, uh, the less I 
even understanding the atrocities in, in, committed in the Holocaust, the less I, I sympathized with with the idea of you know uh, removing Palestinians from their land. And this was something that I came to a conclusion on without the kind of Palestinian baggage that a lot of people um, you know have when they're either Arab or or Palestinian. Um, just kind of something that I came to from from studying the situation and try, kind of looking at it from you know uh, you know human perspective. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it is a complicated story. It's a, it's a complicated topic, and at, and I think you know, we're <laughs> at the we're, very we're definitely at the very least, least it's a long it's it's <laughs> yeah. a long story, and mm-hmm. you know, I kind of I switched my opinion on on this. You know, once I read, it wasn't even like like an activist who uh, presented the information to me. I was actually ter- always turned off from activist like when someone I kind of agree like, with that yeah like I'm always I'm always frankly turned off by activist you know it's always like when someone's like you need to believe this position or right when they're and, super and aggressive angry. about their opinions it's just, and hmm. it is it is it is very off-putting I yeah. will agree so you know my I come from a conservative family um most of my life I've been pretty you know fairly right-wing leaning in most of my positions until I you know became more libertarian later in my life probably over the past five, six, seven years. Um, but prior to that, um, you know, you're, you're, you kind of get this reflux when somebody says something that is uh, pro-Palestine to you, especially when, within the right-wing perspective. You get this like this partisan reflex because because you see it as a le- like another left wing cause like oh man this is just <laughs> yeah. another left wing cause so yeah, I hear that. you know um, if Omar if Alan Omar is pro Palestine there must be something wrong with that position so I'm going to default to the pro Israeli side of the narrative and right that used to be how I used used to think I think that well, yesterday I was actually hanging out with a bunch of my friends who are you know right wing uh, all voted for Trump. And that conversation exactly that played out exactly how I just explained it. Like you know, we were all talking, and then you know they went into like the you know, Alan Omar sucks. Right. You know, right. she's Tlaib like sucks. You clearly know. an anti semi. Mm-hmm. You know, and mm-hmm. she doesn't even realize. And and then they went into like what you know what gay activists don't realize is that the Muslims are the ones who would throw them off. Of, you know, like kind of like yeah. those normal talking points. And right. Then, right. Then they asked, and then like it came Large to me, and I was informed. like, "Yeah, well, yeah. dude, like, do you see what's going on here? It's not bad." And they were looking at me like I had a, you know, a penis coming out of my head or something like that. They were looking at <laughs> yeah. me like I was crazy, and I had a, you know, we obviously talked about it, but you know, it's not, it's not a. You have to understand in America, especially, we're kind of delivered these talking points. Um, and they're reinforced over and over and over and over again to be on the uh, Israeli side of the narrative. And uh, I also noticed that there's actually a lot of people right now are actually really hungry for this information. Like they're, right. they're hungry to learn about the Israel-Palestine conflict because um, they've seen so many other stories or so many other uh, narratives. Conflicting uh, narratives, yeah. That conflicting they, they want to figure out what's going on, right? Yeah. Because they don't, they don't, they don't know, and, they, and you know, everyone talks to them in just like bullet points, like you know, uh, Israel has the right to defend itself. Um, Hamas is a terrorist organization that uses human shields. Right. Um, you know, just going down. You know, it, it, um, if if the Israelis threw down their weapons, you know, the Arabs would, would kill no them. Israel. If the Arabs did, you know, if the what Arabs would you do if case. Washington D.C. got hit with rockets and all this? Yeah, stuff. It, and yeah, like. Mm-hmm. I think it's really necessary to go over like the clear basics and what the Zionist narrative is is that the Jews migrated back to Palestine in the late 1800s and, and the early 1900s to reclaim their ancestral homeland. Mm-hmm. You know, they legally purchased Arab farmlands, and as they started to build these thriving Jewish communities, they were met with violent opposition from the local Arabs, allegedly stemming from a combination of the Arabs' inherent anti-Semitism and also the um, Arab upper class, you know, losing their power to, you know, the the new immigrants. Now, um, the Zionists really only had one option, and that option was to defend themselves. And this is the narrative that continues to this day. 
right. know, it's the narrative that right wingers use. It's also the the narrative that that liberal Zionists use. Right, the left folks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, the major issue with that with this perspective, the evidence, and when I say the evidence, so the quotes, the letters, the documentation from the Zionist leaders themselves, which it, we will definitely show, which we will present overwhelmingly suggest that from the very beginning of the movement, their goal was to remove and displace the Arab population so that Israel could be exclusively a Jewish state. So exclusively a state for Jews. Now, when the Arabs started getting wind of this, they started to oppose Jewish immigration and, and, and land purchases. And I just want to make this clear. Um, you know, I empathize with the early Jews who immigrated to Palestine. Many of them were in very desperate situations. Many of them were escaping intense anti-Semitism. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. Even before the rise of Hitler in the 1930s, there was these very nasty pogroms um, after the assassination of Alexander II in Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a Dreyfus affair in France where you know there was this Jewish captain who was pinned with treason. Um, he was pinned with treason uh, with Germany uh, without any type of evidence. Um, it was revealed, really, that the French upper class just turned on him because he was a Jew. And, and um, you know, France was supposedly the most liberal society in Europe at that time. Right. So I understand that the demand for this national movement so Jews could be the master of their own destiny. It's totally reasonable. Was yeah. totally reasonable at the time. Mm-hmm. I totally yeah. get that they wanted a place to preserve you know, their customs, their history, and that, you know, they were getting the shit end of the stick throughout Europe yeah, all really the time. Bad. Like, mm-hmm. so I 100, I, I probably would have been at that time a Zionist if I was a Jew. Like, I completely can even not see a, even, that perspective. Even not as a Jew, I think it's, you know, from an objective human standpoint, when you looked at the plight of the Jews, you know, during those times, it, it just makes sense, you know? Yeah. And I also understand that in the context of the age of colonialism, this probably didn't really seem like such a big deal. You know, I don't really judge early Zionism with the same moral compass that we have today. However, I do measure modern Zionism with today's moral values. Hmm. And, you know, if we determine in the West that things like racial colonies and concentration camps are wrong, you know, if kangaroo court evictions are wrong, if shooting medics is wrong, if, um, you know, bombing heavily civilian populated area, areas is wrong. If targeting the press is wrong. <laughs> then the Israeli state is engaging yeah. in this very vicious behavior in the 21st century. Right now. Right now. And not only against Arabs in the West Bank, but also in the Gaza Strip. Mm-hmm. So it's, I think that you really have... I think you you have to get real with the situation there. Yeah, no, I agree, and 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 you know, I think in order to get real with the situation today, you have to understand what happened before, because otherwise, then we're just talking in 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 you know empty talking points. In, in these, let's go in these over. Platitudes. Let's talk about let's talk about the ancient history because cool. You know, it's you know, we've been it's kind of a crossroad theme of ours. We always talk about the the crossroads of uh, modern politics and ancient history. And yep, you know, the Zionist claim is built off a um, is linked to the ancient Hebrews and yep, Kingdom of David and all that stuff. And mm-hmm. I don't know. Why don't we just get to that? Absolutely, and and I think it, it helps to set the scene. You know, uh, and as you pointed out, we've been doing a series on you know, how nation states are formed. And we, we were in the middle of Russia and, and, and I think we're, we're going to be taking a little bit of a break so we can discuss this, but, you know, we've always kind of started with that ancient history to give us the context that we need to kind of make sense and make those modern connections, uh, that the nation states are making. Um, and so for this particular topic, I think it's very important to, you know, review that ancient history, because as you said, Henry, the, the biggest claim that Zionism makes is this kind of unbroken several thousand year heritage you know, and, and connection to the land. Um, b- but I, I want to actually start before the Hebrews made their way to the promised land, because I think, you know, it's kind of important. So, 
you know, before, and by the way, this is going to be a like super crash course. I'm going to skip over a shit ton of stuff because we just don't have enough time to do an entire episode uh, on just the ancient history. Um, but so before the uh, Hebrews migrated the area, uh, the, the land was actually known as the land of Canaan, right? And, and it was occupied by the Canaanites. Uh, and this is around 1800 BC. Uh, so the Canaanite civilization um, started way before that even, uh, around 3000 BC, and it, it encompassed the areas of present-day Israel, the West Bank, uh, parts of Lebanon, parts of Syria, and parts of Jordan. And this is not debated either, right? So this is confirmed through both like archaeological evidence, right? That people dug shit up and found, you know, early Canaanite shit, um, but also through the the Bible, right? The the Torah, the 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 holy texts that Zionism uses as the you know uh, the, their main claim to the land. They said that the land was occupied by the Canaanites, and then they came over, you know, um, from Egypt. So you know. Um, there, there was this long history, you know, that happened between, you know, 1800 BC and, and around the second century AD. And I'm going to skip most of it, but, you know, some things that I want to point out, you know, there was this, uh, the Jewish Bolton in, in 1998 um, had wrote, written that, you know, recent archaeological digs uh, provided the evidence uh, that Jerusalem was uh, uh, like a, already a really big fortified city in 1800 BC, like before the Hebrews got there. Um, they found, you know, water systems uh, and 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 large structures there that predated even the the uh, the conquering Israelites um, by almost 800 years, uh, and it was in- incredibly sophisticated, more so than they even imagined. So this is relatively new information that they're that they're finding now, you know, through modern archaeology, which just supports the biblical claims in and of itself. Right. The, the point is, Canaanites were there before the uh, before the Hebrews came over. And, you know, the, the Jewish kingdoms themselves, you know, the Jew, Jewish reign of the land was just one of many, like, periods in the in ancient Palestine or, or in this particular land. I'm going to I'm going to try my best to be fair about what I call the land when uh, and when I call it. So at the time, it wouldn't have been Palestine. It would have been Israel or, or Judea or combination. Well, it was never called the land of Israel. Israel was never a land mass. It was a name of a bloodline. So right. the Israelites from, from well the Jude- kingdom of, of Judea and the kingdom yeah, of yeah um, but the Israel itself was never the the never the name of the landmass it was the name of the bloodline right. like the Israel the Israelites from the the Jacob and Esau story Jacob changes his name to Israel and then that birthed the twelve tribes of Israel so it was right. never called Israel it was always Palestine or Philistine or you know it was never Philistina it was never called Israel. Right, and and you know before that it was the land of Canaan, right? And yeah. It, it, it the the point is that the the land goes through a lot of like name changing and cultural changing and and rulership, and we talk we actually have several episodes, you know, from late last year of ancient history, uh, in the Levant. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. You guys can listen to those episodes, but you know the point is that the extended kingdoms of David and Solomon. Which again are the basis of the Zionist like territorial uh, claims, it only lasted for about seventy three years, and even if you allow for you know the the entire lifespan of, of ancient Jewish kingdoms um, from from David's conquest of Canaan um, to when uh, Judah was wiped out in five hundred and eighty six, you only get about a four hundred year Jewish rule. Um, and, and I'm getting this information, by the way, by, from Eileen Beatty, uh, who wrote uh, Arab and the Jew in the land of Canaan. Um, so, you know, my, my point here is that, yes, they were there. They were there a long time ago. Uh, there were people that were there before them. They, you know, stuck around for a couple hundred years. And then there were people that were there after them, too. I'm not saying that the Zionists can't make a claim based on, you know, an ancestral uh, uh, heritage. However, it's complicated. It wasn't always theirs, and it wasn't. It didn't continue to always be theirs either, right? Um, so, skipping ahead a bunch, by the second century AD, the Romans actually expelled the Jews. Well, from, actually, let me stop you right there because okay. so there's a book called there's an Israeli historian by the name of Shlomo Sand, and he writes a book called The Invention of the Jewish People. And mm-hmm. you know, when he's basically he's telling the story of how the state of Israel was created and how the Zionist movement started. And um, what he is doing, you know, what he says in the book is like, hey, so I went to, um, you know, the um, 
to you know all the sources in Israel, and I was looking. It's like, hey, where do I find the evidence of the like? I want to read about the expulsion, the, the expulsion of Jews from Rome, mm-hmm. like, uh, not from Rome, uh, from Judea uh, into Europe by, by the, the Romans. Romans. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, you know, that actually never really happened. Like that, we, there's no evidence of that. Uh, we we never really say that you know they were expelled. And then you know what they said to him. And these are, you know, Israeli religious, uh, Jewish Isra- religious authorities that there never really was an expel. Like the Jews never really were expelled from by the Romans. Because think about it. There was no like transportation system. There was no like railroads. Like the Romans wouldn't have been able to logistically pull that off at that time. To be well, I mean, to expulsion expel is less about like people. how to have the logistics of, of kicking people out and more so just the, the, the force of doing so. And I, I think you, know, you bring up an interesting point about whether or not they were expelled. I think that's kind of almost irrelevant in this respect because— Yeah, w- it, it is irrelevant. What, like, what I think remains, this history is irrelevant, like, yeah. to be completely honest. I think well, the ancient history is irrelevant to nation well, states I actually or the legitimacy the of a nation is, state. is relevant if we're going to make yeah. a Zionist claim, right? And I just yeah. want to bring bring that up. And I think But, but I just import- want to add, but that, that, the Roman, that is a, a myth. Like, that's an ancient myth that most likely never happened. Well, I mean, the, the, the thing that According we According to religious sure. text itself, it's not something that happened. Well, okay, so like we, we can debate on, on that all we want, and, and I tend to agree with you here, but the, the point, though, is that the people who remained there were a blend of people, right? Lots of different people. There were Jews that still lived there uh, after the Romans m- may or may not have expelled them. You know, there were pagans, there were converts to Christianity. Remember, Rome became a Christian uh, um, empire. Uh, there were also the descendants of Arabs, um, Persians, Samaritans, Greeks, even old Canaanite tribes that stuck around, right? Um, so there were lots of different people living in this in this particular land for a very long time. Uh, it wasn't until the seventh century uh, A.D., of course, that that Arab invaders made their way to you know uh, the Levant and they started converting people to Islam. Um, but importantly, they they intermarried and they effectively Arabized the entire population. So at least since the seventh century A.D., we see a uh, a majority uh, Islamic Arab population in this particular land, and the land was known as Philistina in, in, in Arabic or, or Palestine, you know? And so the, those remaining Arabs, they stuck around for at least 1,200 years until the modern period. And this is where we get to this 1,800 bit that you started your story with uh, with your girlfriend, you know? Uh, and, and by this modern period, there are already almost a million Arab Palestinians living in the area. Before this, before any of the Jewish migration started, and so well, well, just just to go back with that, I have read historians who think that, frankly, the Jews just really never left that area, and that they could just mainly converted to Islam to avoid the um, the tax system, the jizya tax system from the. Uh, from the Arab empire that was created, um, that they just converted to Islam. And yeah, that I mean, I don't, is, I don't that think is, that's that, that is most likely what happened. Yeah. I don't, I don't necessarily think that that goes against what I'm saying either though. You it know, do, like it doesn't, was, yeah, it doesn't go very... what you're saying, but I think that the, the descendants of the ancient Hebrews are the people who continue to live there for centuries. Like they didn't, you know, the Zionist claim is that the descendants of the ancient Hebrews were spread across Europe and, you know, all they're doing is just going back to their homeland. What Shlomo Sand basically says in his book is that, you know, what what happened is that the people and the European Jews are Jews that converted to Judaism, you know, after all of this, all of this history happened. Like they were, they were people who converted to Judaism and then, you know, based their... Uh, national claim based off their united religion, but yeah, like I mean, just to add I, to that, I, I don't, there's no personally. I don't know, you know, I, and and, and it, I think there's there's probably yeah, uh, there's probably truth. There's probably truth to it. There's probably you know uh, tr- truth to the contrary in, instead. And I don't want to get hung up on on you know whether that is. I think the point though is that I think everyone agrees that there wasn't. Everyone everywhere agrees that there were Arab Muslims that were living in the Levant from the seventh century to the eighteen hundreds. I don't think anyone like objects to that 
No, no, yeah, obviously that's true. There's been there have been Arabs speaking there uh, for I guess an unbroken chain for a very long time, and in those regions in the world, um, underneath you know, within the Ottoman Empire, there was actually more Arabization that took place than even the Arab conquest. So mm-hmm. like there was even like a stronger um, adaptation of like Arab customs and Arab language and stuff. Um, right. I don't know specifically in that region, but I know at the very least in other parts of the Ottoman Empire, there was like a higher rate of Ar- Arabization uh, that took place. But right. yeah, we tend to start the story in the 1800s. Because I just want to add real quick. I think that going back to ancient history is like, it's so it's so difficult. And it's so like absurd to use ancient claims um, in a I modern mean, yeah, we context about it to justify every... your existence. Because in, in fact, every country that we've reviewed for for how they created their nation state, we always talk about how you know in in post right in hindsight these nation states draw back on this ancient history as a legitimizing factor for why it is that they are a people or why it is that they lay claim to a land or why it is that they are who they say they are. And while it's interesting context, and in many cases they can make that direct line. What's weird is that you go back so far and shit starts getting muddy you know sh- the the clarity there gets really off because obviously ancient history is hard to you know to prove because <laughs> we have they're to go always on. finding shit you know yeah. like they're always they're always finding new stuff like oh like these archaeological survey like we're, we're not the average person unless you're a specialist in that field is not privy to the, like the new archaeological data that's being found and what evidence is being found like it they're well, always I mean, finding new evidence for like different migrations and things like that. Exactly. It's so murky. Here's and here's an interesting point to that to exactly what you're saying. So, you know, there's the argument, you know, that, you know, Zionists have a strong um, claim to the land because they have this ancient origins, but as we pointed out, there were Canaanites in the land before Hebrews, right? But the Canaanites are don't exist anymore, right? Well, you know, it's been confirmed very recently through genetic testing that that actually the Canaanites, uh, the Lebanese are actually the, the descendants of the Canaanites in many ways, you know? So, you know, by the Zionist argument, shouldn't the Lebanese have a stronger ancestral claim to this particular area? That it's it's just a little ridiculous, right? And then you can also talk about the Romans. I, I've heard this like a million times. It's kind of like a, a meme, if you will, uh, question that is posed in in uh, against the Zionist uh, movement. And but it's it's an interesting thought experiment. It's it's you know the Romans themselves ruled the land longer than the Jews did, right? So. Couldn't the Rome imagine a bunch of Italians coming together saying they're all Romans and they have a claim to the land? It, it sounds ridiculous, right? Like, like why the fuck would would we ever accept that? They but can, like they can claim all of Europe under that pretext. Ex- like, I mean, exactly. They, how long did they um, have control over Britain? I guess. Well, I mean, not as well, long as like the I, British I don't think did. They, yeah, <laughs> maybe a century, a couple of centuries. I'm not. A hundred, I'm not. You, you know, an expert on how long they held on to their imperial right. possessions. Probably a couple of centuries, but I mean, they sure as hell held on to Gaul for a while. You right. know, but like the, the point is, is that it's it's a ridiculous claim, right? Yeah, like nobody would accept a bunch of Italians calling themselves Romans, saying that they want to, you know, um, take back. And Rome and Italy land. aren't the same thing. Like a lot of Italians. <laughs> right. I, just, I don't want to fall off the rail, but I think this could be used as an example. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm watching The Sopranos right now, mm-hmm. and. Um, I'm rewatching The Sopranos, and there's a part where uh, Tony and you know the the Sopranos are are uh, you know intimidating this Orthodox Jew or this Hasidic Jew, and this guy is saying like you know the he's making some some religious claim, and then you know you know our people go back a hundred years, and um, hmm, I'm kind of losing my point right now, but the point that Tony Soprano makes is that we're the descendants of the Romans. Right. Like Italy, it's Italy was a kind of a construct that was created like all the other nationalities. They're exactly. not the descendants of exactly. the Romans. Specifically, point to some genetic lineage, you know. But you know, who at the time of the They're not the same political system, right. the Roman Empire, or even fell, cultural, and then or even cultural chaos, matter, and all these you know? different states mm-hmm. created were created in Italy, and then right. you know it took a long time for there to be a national Italy that was created. Right. So it's absurd to be like, oh, like even like with Mussolini's fascism, they drew upon you know different you know a linkage between r- r- the roman empire right. and you know the state that they were building at it's, that it's time ridiculous. It, it's it, which is just ridiculous because they weren't ridiculous. the same thing there's no right. fucking caesar right now right. in italy right. that's 
So I don't know. Yeah. Sorry to fall off the rails, but I just think that's a useful comparison to uh, explain how reaching that far back into history uh, to, uh, you know, justify a, a national claim is just... It's it's ridiculous. And, and it's it, listen... The, patently absurd. The, the, listen, the, the, the Canaanites don't exist anymore. And the Romans don't exist anymore, not not at least as they once did. And they certainly don't live in this particular region anymore. But w- the reality on the ground is that today, Arab Palestinians do exist, right? They have lived there for longer, arguably, than the Jews did to this very day. And, you know, if, if these Arab Palestinians still exist and they still live there, you know, why don't they have an equally strong claim to the land as Zionism does? And that this is where I get, you know, this is where the question comes to me because, you know, while again, Zionism made sense at the time due to the atrocities and, and the and the plight that the Jews were having all over the world, what what about the Palestinians? You know. Well, it's at the expense of another people. That's the thing. It's like you're creating the state at the expense of other another group of people who already live there. Mm-hmm. And that is the issue that we run into. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't... Oh, what were you saying? No, just, let, let's pause for one second. Uh, those yellow bits, I kind of intend... Mm-hmm. I forgot to tell you, but I kind of intended for you to ask those questions, if that's okay with you. So... What timestamp are we at right now? I know we'll just edit this part. It's 37 minutes. Let me write that down. Okay. Okay. So just be like, well, what, a, you know, Palestine isn't even a state or people because this, I, I do want to discuss this. All right. Because Palestine isn't a state and Palestinian ethnicity isn't real, right? Yeah. Well, you know. Let's talk about that, maybe. So we did an episode a while back about the origins of the Chinese people, and we talked about, you know, the ancient peoples. And, you know, we learned about how diverse the different sets of groups um, were that inhabited the land that we now know as China, came and combined and became known as this Han people. And we quoted this guy, Xiao Tong Fei, uh, who is a professor of uh, Department of Sociology at Peking University in Beijing. And he wrote... um, the general rule in naming an ethnicity comes with the transition from they are called to we are called. People will not consciously agree that they live in a, commu- uh, a common community if they have no contact with the outside world. An ethnicity is not just a community of people with a common way of life. They need to have contact and recognize those outside of their ethnicity before they can recognize themselves as having a shared ethnic identity and ethnic consciousness. And then he goes on to talk about, you know, the the specific Chin or Han peoples. Um, But he ends with saying, it must be noted that in order for an ethnicity to be named, it must first exist as an ethnicity and does not become an ethnicity until it has been named. It's a bit of a chicken and the egg uh, is what he's pointing out. But I think the the important point is, is, you know, this this differentiation. Well, let's 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 pull this. Well, um, Golda Meir. Um, the first female prime minister of Israel, Mm -hmm. she said, she famously said, and this is a common talking point that Mm -hmm. I hear from almost about, from every, you know, super Zionist, is that there is no such thing as Palestinians. Right. No. When there, I have this quote pulled up. When was there, when was there an independent Palestinian people with a Palestinian state? It was either Southern Syria before the first world war, and then it was Palestine, including Jordan. It was not as though there was a Palestinian people in Palestine considering itself as a Palestinian people. And we came and threw them out and took their country away from them. They did not exist. Now, do you remember this? Um, when we were at Danny Sherson's debate, Yep. somebody got up and was like, the Palestinians are Jordanians. Like they're in a mm-hmm. Q&A at the end. Like mm-hmm. they're just Jord- they're just from Jordan. Right. And then Danny Sherson was like, no, they're Palestinian. Like they're right. not Jordanians. But... Fun fact about Golden Meir, uh, Meir um, her and Lyndon B. Johnson are the same person. They have never been in a room together. Really? Yeah, look them up. Hmm. Golda okay. Meir and Lyndon B. Johnson. Just type of, just put it, just Google search. So it's like a, like a Bruce Wayne Batman situation? 
They're the same person. Just t- <laughs> type them. Just look them up real quick. Okay. Golda Meir, Lyndon B. Johnson. I want to see your, re- your, your reaction. Gilda Meir. And Lyndon B. Johnson. Oh, God. And just... <laughs> <laughs> they look exactly the same. It's <laughs> just, it's just exactly it's, it's just uh, Lyndon B. Johnson in drag. <laughs> um, or but, or Golda Meyer in drag, maybe, maybe. So here is the um, the libertarian take on this, and I think mm-hmm. this is the, the 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 correct way to take the the correct way to look at this situation. So I don't think it matters if the Palestinians had a national consciousness or not. I don't think it's relevant because you believe in individual rights. So a person's ethnic, religious, or whatever identifiers uh, that they go by should not give them more rights than others. Therefore, individual self-determination precedes communal self-determination. Mm-hmm. Meaning, I don't believe in Jewish land. I don't believe in Palestinian land or land with any Canaanite like, land. other ethnic, racial, or religious qualifiers. Mm-hmm. Like I, I only really believe in like legitimate land or illegitimate land. Like if you require, if you acquired your land illegitimately or legitimately, and I think that's the major question. Other than to get wrapped up in like, well, yeah, I, I tend to agree with you on that one, a hundred percent, and. Personally, I think going back to Shaotan Fang. And just, just one more thing. Yeah. Even if Golda Meir is right, even if like they are Jordanians, mm-hmm. expelling Jordanians and Syrian immigrants, it doesn't make that justifiable, right? Like even if they legally did move there at that time, still expelling them from the land was still unjustifiable if they legally purchased the land or if they legally well, acquired that Because they land. don't have a thousand year history. So what's the, what's the, what's the yeah. difference if there is a Palestinian ethnicity or not? There, there's and that, and there's definitely just, big holes in that in that argument, right? So it, it's like it, they're they're trying to say on the one hand that that you know they're not real, but they uh, it, that they're not a people. But regardless of like how we want to classify them, they're still there, right? They didn't, they don't not exist on a, like a, on a physical. Yeah, they're plane, still humans. You know? Like who gives yeah, a fuck? They're buff? still there. They're still physically present there, right? So it doesn't matter what you call them, right? It's they're there, right? So you have to deal with that with that issue. And I think, but but even going back to this, because I actually do believe, and I'm half Palestinian, of course, so I'm checking my bias here. I do believe that Palestine is Palestinian is an ethnicity. Um, but w- the reason why I do is because. You know, if we look at that that quote that I just said from Shaotan Fei, Professor Fei basically, you know, he says that if we apply this, you know, ethnicity to Palestinians, that we know we, we know that they live in a community that's Arab, it's Islamic, it has shared beliefs and ways of life. But more importantly, we can see that they 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 recognize themselves by viewing themselves against other ethnicities. In this case, primarily contrasting themselves against the Jewish ethnicity. So it's a little, honestly, it's a little offensive to say, to tell someone what they are, right? You don't get to decide what, you don't get to decide what they are. But like putting that aside, personally, I think you just like, I I get it. I get that. You have, you you don't have a right to be like, you're not a Canadian, you know, you're You're just some French, you know, or something like that. Celtic person who migrate, like you're, you don't get to say that, you know, it's it's not, I know you don't get to say that. And I think and just my perspective has always been I think it's like kind of dumb to get wrapped up in your um you know racial or religious or like whatever ident- identify I, I know that's not the way that most people think unfortunately and mm-hmm. it's kind of like a minority viewpoint but I try to avoid um identitarian type um ways of thinking like you know I, I you know I'm Irish and Polish technically you know um where you know my dad's side of the family is polish my mom's side of the family is is predominantly irish but like you know there's a lot of mixed match in between that you know they're just two nationalities that were grabbed together but i mean i kind of identify as just you know uh, american yeah i guess american which is another right. identity because that's that what i identify use. as despite the fact that i have uh, puerto rican and palestinian heritage you know so and uh, listen whether you agree or not that palestinian ethnicity is a thing is like totally up to you right and i, and I, and I won't I'm not going to argue with people about that, you know, but the, the more pressing question, and I think to your point, you know, on the libertarian perspective is whether Palestine is a state or not that they legally have a claim to, 
that they legitimately have a claim to, or and whether or not the people that are there have this legal claim or legitimate claim to the land or not. And then that kind of brings up the question of like how long Palestine has been like a thing, like an Arab country, right? And, and I mentioned already that, you know, Palestine became predominantly an Arab and Islamic country, uh, country by the seventh century. Was we talked about that, right? And in, in the fifteen sixteen, in, in fifteen sixteen specifically, you know, Palestine became a province of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and as you pointed out, Henry, the, the Arabization of the of the region was actually increased steadily um, under Ottoman rule. And despite the steady arrival of you know Jewish colonists in Palestine. After 1882, it's important to realize that, you know, it wasn't until, you know, the weeks before the establishment of Israel, you know, in, in 1948, that there was ever anything but a huge Arab majority in this particular land, right? So again, this is like the mental gymnastics of Zionism that, that just assumes that nobody lived there. I think there's like a, um, a, a like a saying, it's like a, a land without a people for people without a land, that's that's like one of the one of the Zionist tenets, and it and it assumes that just nobody nobody lived there, <laughs> nobody's there, but people were there, you know, and and this population remained in that country for for you know hundreds of years until the formation of the Israeli state and you know the periodic expulsions of the Palestinians throughout the many wars that followed. Well, let's let's talk about the because this isn't a land issue and something I just want to touch base on before we go for go forward i want to dismiss a claim that a lot of people seem to think is that um well it's impossible to think this if you know anything about the conflict and i'm not trying to sound like like an like a like um like an asshole right now mm-hmm. but a lot of people are like oh it's a religious conflict that's been lasting for thousands of years between jews and Ara- uh, jews and muslims it's not. It's not a religious. There's nothing sectarian. I mean, it it is now kind of sectarian, sure. Just because it's and, divided. And there might have been sectarian. elements of it throughout the history, but that wasn't the main issue. This isn't. But this isn't like a argument over like you know how Who's to practice right. a religion. It's a right. it's, it's it's a straight up argument over land. It's right. a, it's land. It's land. Land. Right. It's land. 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 It's all about who gets what land. That's ex- what. That's what this argument, dispute, conflict is about. It's nothing to do with like. Islam or like any type of like a rooted hatred of one religion versus another because Jews have always been treated much better in predominantly Muslim countries than they had in Christian countries. Like the natural enemy of Jews throughout history has always been very right wing governments. Like that's where they've gone had the you know the worst kind of uh with the exception of like, course of a very right-wing government that is predominantly Jewish. yeah predominantly right now that in that's in israel but like in europe um you know that's who they face the most oppression from and also from christian communities and monarchies that you know kind of scapegoated them throughout history but right. jews Christians used to come pretty especially yeah. yeah if you were a jew in the 14 15 1600s most likely you'd have a lot more uh, you know, it'd be a lot safer for you in Muslim Arab countries rather than than um than rather Christian than Christian region. countries. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, that's where a lot of the Sephardic Jews from Spain migrated to when they were expelled mm-hmm. to escape the anti-Semitism there. So I just want to, you know, kind of address that point that Jews and Muslims had. Li- I'm sure there's incidents, you know, like but you yeah. know, they yeah, they lived without, in without relative. Question relative uh peace with each other for a very very long time Mm -hmm. and also um there were zionists or i don't know if you would call them zionist settlers but you jewish settlers that were coming to israel for a long time for just religious reasons right so exactly Mm -hmm. they weren't going there for political reasons they were going going there there setting up jewish schools and stuff like that Mm -hmm. for for pilgrimage and and those there weren't really any issues with those with those uh jews nope, that were going we, we, there in the we're 1800s. definitely going to talk about that in a, in a bit but i, I want to um, come back to this issue of land because you're absolutely right this is a land issue and i want to talk about how land ownership traditionally worked in palestine specifically under the ottoman rule and when it changed so it would be under well let me let me add one more thing and i think that we could build off it. so 
right now, the current conflict, I just want to bring this back because I don't want to lose sight of this. Yeah. So the Jewish population uses the court system to, to execute and rationalize oppressive policies, notably on the acquisition of land. Right. Like that's what is happening right now in East Jerusalem. So mm -hmm. Zionists use legality as a strategy for the appropriation of Arab land and for the general social control of, of the area's Arab population. And, and you're talking you, about you, the evictions at Sheikh Jarrah. The eviction, that's, that's yeah, the I'm talking about the, yeah. the evictions at Sheikh Jarrah. And the this... So yeah, this is where it gets kind of complicated again because you have to yep. like go back you into the go full story, again. and then you yeah, have to you start have to... bringing up the Ottoman Empire, and right. people are like, "What's a fucking an Ottoman Empire? You mean like have... the thing I it's put like, my feet on?" What's the Ottoman on? Empire have to do? Like, even if you knew what they huh? are, it's like, what do they have to do with it? With like, yeah, today? like what is the Ottoman Empire? Right. And like, who the hell wants to research the Ottoman Empire? I sure as hell don't. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I sure as hell like don't want to read a book on the Ottoman Empire. And we're doing I'm, a history podcast. I mean, I. But so the alienation of Arab land in Palestine began in the late period of the Ottoman rule when right. Jewish individuals and private institutions started to purchase land from Arab owners. Right. And this really ramped up during the 31 years of the British mandate. Mm -hmm. But it was, all, it was part of a coordinated effort directed by the central organizations of the Zionist movement, which um, with really the intent of establishing like a nucleus a territorial nucleus for the creation of a Jewish state. And by far, the greatest number of land transfers from Arabs to Jewish ownership occurred um, after the Zionist movement gained control of the, the state apparatus, you know, in 1948. Right, or when they, not, when they, when they, when they, they created when they created Israel. But, I mean, that but, was only possible because there was a mass expulsion of Jews. Right, I, not, okay, not we're, we're getting, of we're getting super ahead. <laughs> let's, right, let's, talk, let's talk about I just, <laughs> But, all right. Let's let's go back to the motivations for Zionist land acquisition because okay. Jewish I'd, settlers. I'd go, I'd go before that, but c continue. Okay. Do you want to talk? We'll get to that. But this, the the motivations for Zionist land acquisition, Jewish settlers framed their arrival in Palestine as a return right to a land that belonged to them by historical C correct. or divine right. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So you could say mm -hmm. you could say that Zionism was justified by. Um, you know, the high ideals by the notion of liberating Jews from, from you know, injustice and persecution All rather than, right. ra rather than like any type of imperial or economic games, mm -hmm. which, but, which I think was really, which is fair at the beginning. Like, absolutely. I, I really do think that uh, and, and empathize with the early Zionist movement. Yet now the Zionist movement resembled most other kind of settler colonial projects, um, you know, facing the you know, the initial challenge of obtaining land because they needed to obtain land to, to make that dream possible. You got to live somewhere, right? And either yeah. you got to live in places where nobody lives and people didn't live there for a reason, or you have to either live with or expel the people who live in the places that you want to live, right? And that's this is the, this is the issue that we have to wrestle with. And as we already pointed out extensively, there were people living there. People lived there. It didn't, it wasn't empty. And, and okay, so... Again, I want to come back to this land issue because right. this is central to what's happening today, right? This this legality. So, you know, prior to the Ottoman Empire, land ownership in this area. So, by the way, I'm getting a lot of this information from uh, Rashid Khalidi, uh, who wrote a book, uh, Blaming the Victims. Uh, so, the, the basic idea is that the land ownership was uh, in this area was was always super informal, um, and it was just based on who lived there. Right. If you were tilling the land or you were just, you know, you had a house and you were living there for years, that's your land. Right. That's just the way it was. And and this is this is actually called communal rights of tenure. Right. So you live there is yours. Right. Um, in 1858, that changed, though, with the Ottoman Empire. So the Ottoman actually set up this land code which required landowners to register the land in their names. So as I pointed out before this, this wasn't a requirement. You just live there and that's yours. Um so the process to register this land on your name was was actually pretty easy if you knew how to work the system uh, and you had a couple of connections. So what happened as a result uh, was that a lot of the upper class members of the society, the people that were living there, and, and I'm being I'm being honest, I'm talking about both Arab and Jewish and others who just happened to be in the area. You know, they would find these ways to make claims to land that would, you know, regardless of who was actually living on that, living and working on that land, it was for privileged people it was just that easy right 
you were able to just scoop and be like, yeah, that's mine. And if you well, beat- one of the reasons, so the Ottomans they enacted these laws to um, aid the uh, collect like collection of taxes and also right. to facilitate military conscription. Mm-hmm. And what what the holding they were they were called um, Musha holdings. Yeah, they were called Musha holdings, and as um, and basically what it did it partitioned these holdings as. Um, the properties of individual family members. Right. And the I guess the Palestinian peasantry, what they did is that they were doing, to avoid full taxation, they would understate the size of their lands and they would disavow claims of lands. And, um, you know, they would just evade, uh, you know, registering lands to the Ottoman government. And it was also motivated because they wanted to escape conscription to the army. Right, to the army. So what they would do is that groups of villagers would vest the title of village lands into a handful of, like, of of village leaders. And um, I guess it it just created these huge discrepancies between, you know, like, land titles and, like, the actual occupancy of of that land. It it created a disparity between the classes of land ownership. And you're, you're absolutely right. On the one hand, you know, if you were a peasant... You know, and you didn't have connections and you didn't know how to register land in your name, even if you wanted to, you know, it was it was harder for you to do it on your own. And on the other hand, you know, for these for these folks that were in the upper echelons, you know, they were pitching this idea like, hey, you give me the ownership to this, quote, land and I'll take the hit on the taxes and I'll take the, you know, the hit on the conscription bits. and You'll be all right. You know, so there was this kind of almost symbiotic relationship there. But the point, though, is that. You know, these lower class people obviously felt that they owned the land, whether or not, you know, it was on the books with the Ottoman Empire, right? Because they had been living there. They had been tilling that land. It was theirs, right? And again, some of them were avoiding taxes and conscription, which honestly, fair, (laughs) you know? I mean, I got no problem with that. (laughs) Totally fair, you know? But but at the same time, you know, we're, we're talking about the legality of this, right? So legally on the books, they don't own it. Right. Yeah. Or at least according to the Ottoman Empire. And, you know, this under this, you know, they had these absentee landowners, you know, which claimed the land, you know, these upper echelon people. And then they turn around and start selling that land. And oftentimes they were selling this to Jewish settlers or to the Jewish National Fund, uh, which was uh, uh, setting up Zionism in the area. And, you know, under this sketchy deal that the victims here are the poorest people on the land. These were the regular everyday Arab peasants who either could not make a legal claim to the land uh, or, you know, just missed the boat on it, you know, and despite having lived there and worked there for generations. And that's the important part, right? They were there already. This wasn't a custom before this point. And now it is, you know. Let's dive into this because I think this is really important and everyone, no one talks about this part of the story. It's, It's like everyone or... People talk about it, but they sum it up in a sentence. So, um, like, the actual process of land acquisition Mm -hmm. in the pre-state period. Because that's, like, you know, kind of like what a lot of people are arguing about. Right. Um, And you you mentioned, like, the Jewish National Fund. So, the Zionist colonization in Palestine, it begins in 1881. Right. So, when a group of Russian Jewish immigrants, they found the... Uh, Rishon Lezion, Le Zion colony, um, like you know, outside of Tel, like what is present day Tel Aviv. And over time, a variety of, of groups formed to, to finance the immigration of Jews to um, these Palestinian agriculture colonies. The most important of these were there's two major ones in the early pre state period. It was the Palestine Net Jewish Colonization Association, which was funded by. Um, Baron Rothschild, which I know a lot of people kind of obsess over the Rothschilds. Right. For some, some we people have like this weird fetish, like, oh, Rothschild, uh, which <laughs> I don't like to really do. Um, but, and then there was the Jewish National Fund, which right. is like the major one that everyone knows, um, or most, you know, most people will bring up. It, it's It was initially... So initially, like Zionist colonization, it moved at a pretty slow pace. 
However, it was after the British started backing the Zionist movement. And because the British administration was new, large layer Arab landowners really lost the ability to um, you know, accumulate the property through informal political structures as they were doing it you know, during the Ottoman Empire. So right. a, as a result, many of these Arab landowners, they sold their estates to the Zionist settlement organizations. So it is true. Like what, like that part of the narrative is right. Like mm-hmm. a lot of the la- absentee la- la- landowners, they did sell, they, they, let, they sold these uh, pieces of land to the settlement organizations that but, with the intention of, you know, creating, you know, bringing more Jews. But, but again, those, those landowners weren't the people who were living and working that land. Exactly. They were just the people who happened to scoop up the title from the Ottomans. Ex- ex- exactly. So as a result, many of the la- Ar- these Arab landowners, um, I mean, as a re- the, the estates and the villagers, they were evicted and they had no legal recourse. And by the end of the mandate period, um, well, I definitely want to talk only... about the. I want to talk about the mandate in, in right. a little bit because I want to stick to this particular period okay. because this early migration is super interesting because this is a lot, of, a lot of where the the Zionists get their legal framework, you know, today to do the the types of things that we're seeing in Sheikh Jarrah, you know. So as you can imagine, the, the arrival of these you know Zionist Jewish settlers wouldn't exactly have been met with open arms by the Arab peasants who are living there and who are farming there. You know, because they're getting evicted, right? They're getting removed from their land that they believed was theirs, but because of legal, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, issues, were basically shit out of luck, right? And but but you know, in this time, the the, the aversion to Zionist settlements was less about like anti-Semitism and more about just like honestly a reasonable feeling that they were getting a raw deal, right? And and the Zionist movement at the time also had clear goals, which involved removing the Arabs from that land, right? So they set up what was called, you know, as, as you pointed out, the Jewish National Fund. And the, the stated goals of, of the Jewish National Fund was literally to acquire land in Palestine for the settlement of Jewish people. And, and you know, they, they, they wrote that, you know, they wanted to, quote, redeem the land of Palestine as the inalienable possession of the Jewish people. Interesting note that they literally called it the land of Palestine, kind of makes for, you know, uh, some tricky issues when you want to make the claim that Palestine wasn't a thing. Um, They said so themselves. Um, So this is, uh, I think you mentioned his name before, Theodore Herzl. You know, this was backed up by, you know, a lot of the key figureheads in the movement. I think 91 Herzl had said, uh, and I'm quoting him now, uh, we shall try to spirit the penniless Arab populations across the border by procuring employment for it in transit countries while denying it employ- employment in our own country. Both the process of expropriation and the removal of the poor must be carried out discreetly and circumspectly. So basically, they're trying to set up ways to exclude the Arabs that live there from the economy and saying, hey, you can go work over there in Jordan or you can go work over there in Syria. They've got money for you, but not here. And so they set up both a system of oppression on purpose, economic oppression on purpose there, and they they also coupled that with the expulsion of the people who didn't want to leave the land because they had, you know, they didn't have a, quote, legal claim to it. And what's interesting is is northern Palestine, because in northern Palestine, there was a bunch of Arab farmers who refused to leave. Uh, and but but since the Jewish National Fund had, like, quote, legally purchased the land from these, you know, absentee landowners, they actually asked the Ottomans to evict them. And they did. Right. So the Ottoman Empire did evict these folks in the northern areas. And, you know, this, this is where it gets troubling. And I think, you know, I want to go back to an earlier point you made about there there have already been Jews there, especially the ones that were, you know, there for religious reasons. And, and what I find that's so interesting about them is that many of them didn't subscribe to the Zionist movement. They didn't want to stir up the pot. That's an important trouble. point to make. A lot of a lot of Jews, religious Jews. Who were living there. They were actually who were living there. there. They were like, hey, man, this is going to screw up relations with the Arabs that are here. Right. And they were, like, they were living like, in, in peace with them. Relative, yeah, of course. Overtly creating a, um, I mean, the, the overt, overtly stating your intentions to create a exclusionary state here that excludes them 
is gonna is not gonna be go over well. Like right. people are gonna get pissed. Right. Like who would be like wouldn't you be pissed too? Like yeah, all right, totally. let's just say if a Chinese, a bunch of Chinese people started. I, I don't want to. Man, people are gonna take this the wrong way, but I'm gonna stand by this analogy. So a bunch of Chinese people start moving into wherever you live, just like boats and boats and boats and boats and boats of them, and then they overtly start saying, "We're gonna make this a Chinese state." <laughs> like, what would you? How would and you, you can't, react? And like, you we're can't gonna make work this here, China. Right? We're gonna China from America, all jobs. right? Where we have our own government, our own prime minister, and right. uh, everyone else can go kill themselves here. Like that would fu- that would upset you. Uh, like right. that would upset and it you. doesn't matter I've, who it was it could be the chinese it could be the canadians it could be the mexicans it could literally be anyone insert God, name of the people. canadians jesus right. christ insert name of the of any people you want like if this happened if this issue happened you would you wouldn't be very fucking happy about it you know the canadians are always up to that <laughs> um all right I, I just want to give a quote real quick this is from don peretz he writes a book uh the arab israeli dispute uh, and he writes, uh, before the 20th century, most Jews in Palestine belonged to the old Yishuv, or community, that had settled for more religious than political reasons. This, by the way, is the, the thing that you were mentioning uh, earlier, Henry. Um, there was little, if any, conflict between them and the Arab population. Tensions began after the first Zionist settlers arrived in the 1800s, uh, when they purchased land from the absentee Arab owners, leading to the dispossession of the peasants who had cultivated it. Um, so according to Perez, uh, at this time, you know, we have these Jews living in Palestine and the Jews and the Palestinians there lived in relative peace together. And they weren't really squabbling until mass migration started happening uh, from the Zionist movement. And there were even proposals um, in the Zionist movement, which I can actually get behind, to have kind of a Arab Jewish cooperation for, you know, among this uh, uh, migration. So there's this guy, uh, Yitzhak Epstein. Uh, he was honestly one of the few Jewish Zionist uh, leaders who was a Palestinian, meaning it was one of the Jews that lived there before, right? And it gave him kind of a, a special understanding of, you know, the Arab way of life and thinking. But he was a Zionist, right? He did support the migration of, of um, you know, Jews to, to Palestine because of the aforementioned reasons and atrocities that they had been, you know, um, uh, experiencing. And so he wrote uh, in, in a 1907 article, um, he called uh, for a Zionist policy towards the Arabs, uh, you know, after 30 years of settlement activity. And, and he claimed that that no good land is vacant. So Jewish settlement meant Arab disposition, dispossession. Uh, so Epstein's solution to the problem uh, to and, and to cause less trouble uh, was the creation of kind of a binational, non-exclusive program of settlement and development. And in it, he wrote uh, that purchasing land should not involve dispossession, dispossession of peasant farmers, meaning we, we shouldn't be getting land by kicking other people out. Instead, what he proposed is uh, a cooperative uh, partnership. So kind of like creating joint farming communities where Arabs share the land, but the Jews bring modern technology and money, right? And that would kind of a win-win situation. He also uh, proposed that schools and hospitals and libraries should be non-exclusivist, meaning you know anyone should be able to go to them, and specifically education should be bilingual, so both uh, Hebrew and um, uh, uh, Arabic. Um, but pretty much no other Zionist leader liked this idea. Personally, I thought I think it was a good idea. Yeah, I mean it was a better idea than what what you know the. The, the mainstream Zionist idea obviously was is, has led to the conflict that we have right now. So be, maybe being more um, inclusive would would have helped. But you know, to go back to like the pogroms, right? And, and I just want to give credence to the again, like the you know the empathy that I do show, and I think we both do yeah. show to the early Zionists because it's it's justified, like. It's not justified to expel people from their land. However, I put put your put your I I, I want to put my shoe on the other foot or put my whatever the expression is. You know, be empathetic and see the reasoning why they did it and what you would do in that situation. Analogy: um, These pogroms were intense, and it's a pretty frustrating time. Because they were being forced to leave places like Russia and Mass, and it was very sad. And they understandably needed to go somewhere. A lot of 
Jews decided to come to America, though. Yep. Because Palestine wasn't that attractive. Like, no. Not every... More Jews went to America. So it's not like they were yeah. like, oh, like, this is some, like, really attractive place. Like, let's go into the middle of the desert. Like, yeah. I mean, by 1900, almost a million Jews migrated to the U.S. alone. And they also went to other European countries. And the reason, as you pointed out, is because Palestine kind of sucked. You know, it was under it was definitely underdeveloped, and it was mostly like an agrarian economy, and most of the land had already been occupied by Arabs. You throw in the fact that you know World War One was happening, and nobody wants to go live in a desert and basically start over in the early twentieth century. Like they wanted to live comfortably and have like opportunities and and a better life for their families after experiencing this shit. You know what I mean? Well, let, let's go actually go back because that's an important point that you that you uh, that you brought that actually goes into how the early Zionist movement was sold. Mm -hmm. So, the way that Zionist leadership was able to sell this to the British was that they were able to sell it under the guise of guise of economic development. So, what they basically were saying is like, hey, like. We're going to go there and we're going to create industry and create, you know, cities and create trade and create, you know, all these things that are going to develop this land and make it better. And it's going to serve your interest. Um, they did in that process sell, you know, tell, say, hey, Arab society was primitive. I mean, it clearly, you know, it was based off agriculture and agriculture society. Um, also, there was a very big urban center in Jaffa. Mm -hmm. um, but a good starting point, yeah. But I mean, look, going to but, going to Palestine, as you point out, was rough, though. You know, it, it was kind of like going out west during the U.S. expansion. Like, sure, yeah. it presented some really unique opportunities, you know, for you know, especially economic opportunities. But you had to work really fucking hard at it, and. Just like in Israel, uh, there was always this issue of butting heads with the natives that lived there whose land you were going to be claiming. So actually, there's a lot of right. parallels between the two. Well, I have this, I have this quote. I just, want to, I just want to bring this up real quick because I just searched it because I think it's important. So this is from Alfred Bone, director of, of the Economic Research Institute of the Jewish Agency. Um, and he wrote this regarding Arab feudalism. So he writes, these Arab states exhibit a uh, heretofore the typical features of an oriental administration and oriental mentality, which are found among the governing and governed alike. These relations between the masses and the state are largely determined by the old feudal pattern with the fate of a state placed almost exclusively in the hands of, lar of, of a class of large landowners. The landless population in the village and town has practically no say in any of the representative bodies and is thus without political influence, a state of affairs that breeds indifference among the masses towards the state and its functions. So I guess he asserted that this oriental administration lacked capacity to raise things like living standards and mm. level of education and health services. So Zionist colonization was sold or maybe even justifiably i mean i re remember reading the book um well i mean it would have been justifiable if they would have gone with you know epstein's idea of like direct integration with them and and you know making like a mutual or symbiotic relationship with the with the arabs that lived there but that's not the route that they decided to go yeah but it, it would have been you know for social and economic development and man i remember reading one of the books that really kind of kind of open everyone has that moment um i don't know if i necessarily had a moment but a book that really kind of uh opened my mind up with middle eastern politics it was an old history book called a peace to end all peace it was written in the 1970s by um david Frompkin, who's not a political writer very vanilla historian but i remember him writing like the whole selling point of the of the zionist movement to the british was the was the like they're like the Jews are going to bring a lot more prosperity to the region, so that's why we should favor them, and that's what ultimately led to the Belfort Declaration and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, I remember him really hinting on that, and that it sounds like the mentality, like the you know the you know the kind of like the colonialist uh, just. It's funny because British people today, 
still justify colonialism when you talk to them, or some of them do at least. Oh, we brought like, we know, brought civilization to all of these yes, people. It had its faults, but <laughs> think about the think about India and all the progress we brought there. Yeah. Think about all the places that the British Empire, you know, brought progress and economic development to. Mm -hmm. You know, I was watching this documentary on the Suez Crisis and, you know, when the British ultimately were kicked out of Egypt for good. And they were interviewing these British soldiers who were, you know, they were like, when we went to Egypt, people were throwing shit out at us. People were, um, you know, they they greeted us in a very hostile manner. And we were all surprised because we were the British Empire, like... I, we thought all these people loved us because, you know, we were seen as these like kind of um, higher minded people that brought civilization to the primitive people worldwide. Um, so. It, I, they were really playing at like the Zionists were really fit. playing at the British heart str- heartstrings there. Exactly. You know, like they, they were playing to their, you know, singing, preaching to the choir, if you will, you know. Ex- exactly. Yeah. So. Um, well, let, let's sorry talk to go about the, off in that rail. No, it's it's cool because this is a good transition to the British Mandate period and and the Balfour Declaration, you know, and how it basically promised a Jewish homeland in Palestine. So, you know, if the Jews were going to go anywhere, especially Israel, you know, they were going to need. Well, well to, before, well, we're going to talk about World War One. So, okay. um, sure, let, let, let's do that. Well, let's just give a brief outline because yeah. this is a time of world world war is going on. Right, mind you, let's, let's not forget and, that point. <laughs> Let's, let's, let's forget that there is a savage, savage war going on in Europe and about to be a savage war in Turkey when the British expand their, their front there. And, you know, the war effort for the British during World War I in the beginning when they invade uh, Turk, the Ottoman Empire is, is a disaster. It's a disaster when they, when they invade Gallipoli. Mm-hmm. There's, no, there's no military advantage that they create. It's just death. And they sacrifice a lot of young people, a lot of young Australians, and a lot of young British guys. That's right. For fucking nothing. And they're running up and to go back. We have a lot of Australian uh, listeners, so good to play at the hearts. They sacrifice a lot of Australians on on Gallipoli. That's right. And they, um, you know, their, their strategy after that was to, use the Arab populations to revolt against the Ottoman Empire. And they what they did is they overpromised them land. They promised yeah. everyone land mm-hmm. that they couldn't give them because they overpromised everyone. And the real intention was for the British and the French to just kind of draw lines everywhere. Um, you know, Sykes it kind of stems people. back from the British and the French had like their own imperial um relation like disputes that they were trying to settle from the 1800s that they were that kind of carried over to how they were going to divide the middle east and of course the british were trying to draw lines over resources that they wanted and the french were trying to draw lines over things that they thought they had historical claims to like damascus and shit like that Mm -hmm. so it all ended up being um just a big lie to the arabs it's like hey come on we'll get if you help us win this war if you if you sabotage and revolt and um, it was you know, an insurgency is what basically yeah. insurgents to the Ottoman Empire and give them a headache. You're all going to be kings. And we selected the kings for you already. Like we already already have it lined up. Come on, Hashemites. We <laughs> yeah, got a bunch right. of Hashemite kings everywhere. Yeah. Put a fucking Hesh. It's like the standing by put a ready to, king. to rule we, over you. Just put a Hashemite king on it. and Shut up. Mm-hmm. That's a that was how they uh, what's his name? Um Chalabi said that to yeah. the neoconservatives when yeah. they were talking about invading Iraq. Like, hey, don't worry. When we when we overthrow Saddam Hussein, just put a Heshemite king on there again, and they're all going to love it. Like, they <laughs> love having Heshemite kings, even though the last one was killed. Right. <laughs> like, the last one was assassinated in the, in the 50s. Right. What do you, like, what do you, th- what do you think is going to happen? All right. Sorry, we're, we're getting, no, we're, we're getting off topic. Back. We're getting off topic. <laughs> Um, I'm watching, I'm listening to too much Scott Horton and he'll tend to do stuff like this. And, (laughs) you know, um, I kind of just parrot whatever he says anyway. Now, um, all right. So we we were talking about like, okay, world war one's happening, crazy atrocities, British decide to, you know, um, make an offer that they can't, you know, um, write a check they can't cash with the Arabs that lived in the region said like, Hey, if you guys help us out, we will give you land. 
But that, of course, was just a you know handshake agreement that there was no <laughs> official documentation written down for that. And then you know come the end of the war, you know Sykes Pico happens, they drop their borders and stuff like that. And then we come to this uh, ball for declaration, uh, and and this one is is particularly contentious um, in this in this um, in this story of the Israeli Palestinian conflict. So. You know, I was I was mentioning before if if the Jews were going to go to Israel, you know, they definitely needed to figure out where to live, you know, either by evicting Arabs or living with them, um, and they also needed to figure out how to rebuild the country and have a good life, and you know, it's a tough call, and they were going to need, you know, help doing it, and that help eventually came from the British after after the First World War, you know, um, so in this time the British actually occupied Palestine, um, it was the, the the British mandate there. And then they made what was called the uh, Balfour Declaration, which basically then turned around and promised the Palestine to the Jews. Uh, there's a number of things that are messed up about this declaration. Uh, I think the first one is that it was made, obviously, by a foreign entity, a European power. And it was made about a territory that was not European. And that it disregarded the actual people who were living there, right? And namely the, the Arab uh, Palestinians, and there's no there's no two ways around those facts. You know, a- after after helping the British beat the Ottomans in World War II, I think the British ba- they basically left the Arabs, you know, with nothing. You know, they 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 did whatever the fuck they wanted with the spoils, and part of it was the Balfour Declaration. Um, so, but what's important to note about this, I think, is that the Balfour Declaration wasn't it, it was a public statement. It wasn't a legal process. That that legal process didn't come until later. Um, you know, in 1920, the the British set up what was called the Palin Court of Inquiry, uh, and this was to figure out what were they going to do with Palestine. You know, obviously we had some contradictory promises that they made. They had promised it to the Arabs during the war. They had made this Balfour Declaration, uh, promising it to the Jews. They're basically promising everything. So the British really fucked it up. Uh, so they set up this uh, inquiry to just figure out what, like, how do we resolve this? And in this time, the Zionists really used this as an opportunity to make, you know, arguments for the land, and and they were particularly aggressive about it. So much so that, you know, uh, the the folks that were in charge of the commission were worried that, you know, they would have to, you know, that that the Zionists were forcing their hands in their favor. Um, and this is the this is the part that I, I can't find a whole lot of information on, but that I've that I've heard a lot of anecdotal evidence for and it was that the palestinians w- were involved in this process but they were described as as having lacked interest and that they were unprepared in in this uh palin court of inquiry i honestly c- couldn't find specific quotes supporting this claim uh so for me this part is inconclusive um i think though despite the lack of evidence there you know that that the the Arab parties were less involved. I think what's what's very well documented is how fervently the Zionists made their claims, uh, which is very likely why you know uh, the Zionists ended up with a win here. But but what's super troubling about the Zionist claims is is when you look at them and, and read them. I'm going to give you several quotes from them. It's super frustrating because they were super open about how they didn't want to make a compromise. They wanted the entire country for themselves and. This was obviously at the expense of the people that were already living there, and, and they didn't care. They were very flagrant about this, and I, I just want to share with you a couple of um, a couple of quotes here. Here's one. Um, so, uh, Doctor Ader, uh, I'm, I'm getting this by the way from a Sam Hawadi's book, Bitter Harvest. Uh, so, Doctor Ader, who was a member of the Zionist uh, Commission, uh, boldly told the Court of Inquiry, and he said this. He said, "There can only be one national home in Palestine, and that." a Jewish one, and no equality in the partnership between Jews and Arabs, but a Jewish preponderance as soon as the numbers of the race are sufficiently increased. He then asked that only the Jews should be allowed to bear arms. So this guy, head member of the Zionist Commission, who was on the court of inquiry, making their argument for what they want out of this, you know, uh, um, out of this declaration is that they want it all. They want the entirety of Palestine. And and then he, you know, follows it up by saying like, oh yeah, and also only Jews should have guns, <laughs> which I thought was pretty crazy. 
And, you know, this this episode obviously That sounds like a fair country. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And, and In the context, I mean, the U.S. Uh, probably wasn't really fair at that time, was it? Huh? No. No. And I'm pretty sure we did something similar with the Native Americans anyway. Um, but, you know, I digress. I, I think this episode obviously didn't go very well with the Palestinians. And in 36 to 39, there were some pretty intense um, Palestinian Arabs like nationalist revolts. Yeah, Noam Chomsky talks about this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually, I'm I have some quotes from him, actually. So, um, And he's specifically quoting David Ben-Gurion, who is the first prime minister of Israel. And this was in his book, The Fateful Triangle. Um, and he, he said that Ben-Gurion said in an internal discussion, in our political argument abroad, we minimize Arab opposition to us. And then he goes on to say, uh, politically, we are the aggressors, and they defend themselves. Their country is theirs because they inhabit it, whereas we want to come here and settle down. And in their view, we want to take away from their country while we are still outside. A people which fights against the usur usur uh, usurpation of its land will not tire so easily. So I honestly don't know what to say about this. This is the first— Well, Ben-Gurion has a ton—is is, is Israel's George Washington. I know. And there's a lot of quotes like this. I there's, know. There, so, there's a I have lot of so quotes. many of them. I there, have there's so many, so many quotes on this that it's going to get repetitive, but, but the amount of documentation on the early Zionists themselves, like, I mean, at this point, we're not even at the early Zionists. We're at the Zionists that actually are going through the bloody process of right. creating the state— and, and he's saying um, himself that they know that they're in the wrong, that they were the aggressors, but they're going to do it anyway. So by his own words, the revolting was justified. And then, of course, that those violent revolts were suppressed violently by the British. Well, let's just go back because the Zionists, remember, they legally bought the land before Israel was established by those absentee landlords. Hey, it's not their fault that they screwed it up. Like, hey, they just bought the land and it's it's legally theirs and, you know, like, sorry. Okay, so some context. Because, yes, you're right, they did legally purchase the land, but when you find out, like, what what that proportion is, it's it makes it a little trickier. So according to Edward Said in his book, The Question of Palestine, in, in, in 48, there was, uh, uh, it was a moment when, uh, excuse me, in 48, when Israel declared itself a state, it legally owned only a little bit more than 6% of the land of Palestine. Just a little more than 6%, legally. And then after 1940, when the British authority restricted Jewish landowner, so the British authority restricted Jewish land ownership to specific zones inside of Palestine. So they said, you can have authority over these areas. And then there was a different zones and it was about 65% of the total area um, for the Arabs. And there continued to be illegal buying and selling within the, the zone that was restricted specifically to Arabs. So when the partition plan was announced in 1947, which I'd love to talk more about in a second, it actually included land that was purchased legally, that 6% that we were talking about, but also land that was illegally held by Jews when the British told them they can't purchase or uh, 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 exercise land in the Arab zones, but because they had already done it, it was included in the 1947 partition plan. So after Israel announces its statehood, they immediately start making a large number of laws uh, to legally claim huge areas of Arab land. But the people who were there, the Arabs, the Palestinians, were expelled, and they became refugees, and they were pronounced absentee landlords. And in order to keep them from coming back to their land, uh, they basically started bulldozing all of the land and then setting up new shit. And so the question about the legal claim of Zionists buying the land is super sketchy at best because, you know, by circumstances— of creating a new state of Israel, they decided to set up, you know, legal systems so that they can, quote, legally go through the process of taking more land. I mean, I mean they're self-dealing. Exactly. If you make up the rules along as you go, then sure, it's, quote, legal, right? I know. 
Well, again, I that's I said I think I said this that what the system that we have right now is that and we're going to be before we end this episode, we need to talk about the Human Rights Watch report. Absolutely. Yeah. Um but um just just to go back, it the court system is used to acquire land. Like it's used is used as a oppressive tool and the human rights system the the human rights watch thing that we're saying the human rights watch report that's 200 pages long by the way it's very thoroughly researched um it it goes over that that um how how the court systems are basically just you know meant to fuck arabs out of their homes but um i mean it was so clearly and patently bullshit what was happening at this point you know that like they were just making up the rules as long as they go and you would think that the international community would be like, hey, that's not cool. But re- remember that I mentioned that the majority of the Jews that were fleeing persecution in Russia from the pogroms, uh, they actually moved to Europe and the U.S., right? So the majority of the, the, those people became constituents of those nations abroad. So generally speaking, I think most uh, Jews across the world, no matter what country they were in, supported Zionism because of their own experiences fleeing the pogroms, right? Remember, this is the the very rational and very justified, well, maybe not justified, but very understandable position that you're in where you're like, hey, shit, we just experienced major shit, including pogroms, including the Holocaust, you name it, like it was fucked. So most people, most Jews were in support of Zionism, even if they didn't themselves decide to go move to the new state of Israel. And, you know, they're now residents there's now citizens of different nations and this is a funny quote by truman so uh u.s president truman you know he was quoted in saying uh on the question of like you know these weird legal land grabs uh he said i'm sorry gentlemen but i have to answer to the hundreds of thousands who are anxious for the success of zionism i do not have hundreds of thousands of arabs among my constituents so this is just one example and there are many of how the international community at the time would often side with the Zionist movement. I mean, after all, as Truman puts it, there weren't huge Arab communities in the United States or in Britain or in France or elsewhere, anywhere, to protest the actions of the new state of Israel. So that was that. Well, you know why that Truman is. So um, this is really, you're going to find this interesting. Um um, Kermit Roosevelt, so oh. someone that we've talked about a lot on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, we like Kermit. Is a very is a very interesting uh, human being, and he was very. Kermit Roosevelt is the guy who is um, he's the grandson of Theodore Roosevelt. Mm-hmm. He had a one of the first CIA guys agents, yeah. and he is the guy he conduct con, he thought of and carried out the plan almost as a rogue agent of uh, overthrowing the Iranian, Iranian democracy mm-hmm. in 1953. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he's very interesting because he was actually an Arabist. Well, that's how he would describe himself. Very like he was very, very pro Arab and he, you know, he was someone who really had his own views on the Middle East and what the U.S. should be doing. And, and a lot of it centered around having a really strong cooperation with Arabs versus communism he was a very staunch Mm anti-communist that's why he said that he overthrew the 53 government is because they were going you know they were on the verge they were cozying up too much with the soviets huh well because they were nationalizing the oil company Mm -hmm. and and like they were about to they were about to become a communist country that's why he said he had to carry through with it or at least that was his justification um because eisenhower had told him to stop with those plans but um to go back, he wrote this really big, long essay that um, people are actually bring this essay back up and be like, oh, Kermit Roosevelt wasn't actually a raging anti-Semite. He wasn't really an anti-Semite. He was just, he kind of saw that he knew, he really understood the region at the time. He was one of the experts. And he wrote this essay um, about the partition of Palestine. And he's saying like, hey, listen, like every single serious businessman Every single, every every businessman, every single person um, in the United States that really knows about this region is against this, and this is only happening because Truman is 
trying to get win New York right in the in the upcoming election. Which, like that's why he's why, no, that's why no he's favoring New York the, was at had the the largest population of yeah. of and that, expat and Jews. And is, because before World War II, U.S. interest in the Middle East was only like um, uh, charitable organizations and, and business dealings. It was, there was no national interest in the Middle East until after like after World War II, after the U.S. kind of discovered that, um, you know, after we witnessed uh, Nazi Germany lose the war because they ran out of oil, right. that's when the U.S. was like, hey— uh, you know, maybe we gotta be friends with these uh, these uh, Arab people, kings, the Hashemite kings. <laughs> That's why we have to be friends with the Ibn Saud, the king of Saudi Arabia, because we just, you know, need that black gonna, gold. Because you know, at that time, they're like, oh yeah, these these people um, believe we it's we're 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 thinking that they have a lot of oil at this time. Mm-hmm. They're like, yeah, we think they may have the most oil in the world. Um, but I just wanted to make that point about why um, Truman. I, I think one one was the main reasons why Truman, um, you know, sided with the uh, you know Israeli or Jewish side than the Arab side. Sure. Yeah, and I think it, it makes sense, right? I can't. You can't really fault the guy, right? Because he's right. You know, every every leader of every country is 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 held accountable by their constituents. And just by numbers alone, there were millions of Jews that lived in the United States that were all proponents of Zionism, right? So why would they ever say anything about it? But, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the 1947 partition plan because, you know, it it sucked. And this is kind of like the start of, in my opinion, this is the start of of the modern conflicts that we see uh, with the Israel-Palestine. Like everything that we've talked about prior to this is just setting the stage literally for this. And every, in my opinion, every conflict thereafter, after the 1947 partition plan, is just kind of an echo of the same problem over and over and over again. And so, you know, even though the Zionists uh, uh, signed on to this 1947 plan, it sucked and nobody liked it. So the Palestinians didn't like it because obviously they felt that they were losing their land and they straight up just didn't agree to the partition at all. Uh, And the Zionists didn't like it specifically because they didn't want to share. (laughs) They didn't want to share any of the land with the Palestinians, but they they still physically signed on to it. But, you know, (laughs) let's just go with some quotes. I think it's better to to, to say it that way. Here's here's some more fun, fun quotes from Noam Chomsky's book, The Fable Triangle. On this particular subject, so he, he quotes Ben Gurion, who is the, again the first prime minister of Israel, the the George Washington of Israel. He says, uh, "After we become a strong force, as a result of the creation of the state, we shall abolish partition and expand into the whole of Palestine." Okay, how about another one? Uh, this is Menachem uh, Begin, who is the founder of the Likud party and was the sixth prime minister of Israel. He writes. He said, uh, the partition of the homeland is illegal and it will never be recognized. The signature of institutions and individuals of the partition agreement is invalid. It will not bind the Jewish people. Jerusalem was and will forever be our capital. Eretz Israel, so the land of Israel, uh, will be restored to the people of Israel, all of it and forever. You want some more? Cool. Cool about Joseph Weitz, who he was the director of the Jewish National Land Fund. Uh, this is on uh, December 19, 1940. Uh, he wrote, uh, It must be clear that there is no room for both peoples in this country. The Zionist enterprise so far has been fine and good in its own time and could do without, quote, land buying. But this will not bring about the state of Israel. That must come all at once in a manner of a salvation. This is the secret of the messianic idea. And there is no way besides transferring the Arabs from here to the neighboring countries to transfer them all, except maybe for Bethlehem and Nazareth and old Jerusalem. We must not leave a single village, not a single tribe. Oh my God. Here's some more. Ben Gurion again, George Washington of Israel. Uh, With compulsory transfer, we would have a vast area for settlement. I support compulsory transfer. I don't see anything immoral on it. Okay, that's enough for now. So from the start, 
there's a lot more there's of those so folks too. Many, I just want to add. There's, like, there's a lot of there's a lot of there, there, there's too many to read on the podcast. Yeah. I think we got the point across, yeah. though. I, I mean, from the start, this is the point. The, the st- from the start of this, and and from the partition, the key leaders of the new state of Israel never intended to stick with the partition plan. So their motivations were absolutely clear and loud, and their intentions were always to expand and create a larger state. You know, I do want to I do want to make the pendulum swing in the opposite direction though, because. Putting this whole blame on the partition plan for not working out also lies with the Palestinians. You know, sure, they felt strongly that they had a claim to the land, and we've extensively and exhaustively showed that they've been living there. And you know, despite legal nonsense, you know, they legitimately any any normal human being would would probably side with them that you know they had a claim to the land. But the, the point is, by the time by this time by the 1947 you know, a, a partition plan, the state of Israel had been created. It was there. It was a thing. And it had international backing and recognition. And Palestinians' failure to accept that, and to a certain extent, even to today, accepting the state of Israel, you know, and coming to the table to find a way forward was a huge, huge mistake. And they would come to regret that to this day. You know, it, it's, it's a shitty situation, and they totally made the wrong call. Here's, here's an, art, an article I found uh, by Reuters. Um, is Mahmoud Abbas, so uh, uh, um, you know, leader of the PLO, uh, was saying, at the time, 1947, there was Resolution 181, the partition plan. Palestine and Israel, Israel existed, Palestine di- diminished. Why? And then the interviewer asks him and suggested that the reason was that the Jewish leaders accepted the plan and it was rejected by the Arabs. And then Abbas goes on to say, you know, I know, I know. It was our mistake. It was our mistake. It was an Arab mistake as a whole. But do they punish us for this mistake for 64 years? So even, even the Palestinians agree. They should have fucking signed on to the deal and, and at least been like participated in it to, to make it more legitimate and, and to try and find a way to, you know, around this shitty situation. They know that they made this mistake. So... It's, it's a really good question, though, that Abbas brings up. You know, if, if the punishment for not accepting the state of Israel in 1947 and then, you know, subsequently going to war about it, d- does that really warrant the oppression that we're going to talk about later, you know, for so long? I mean, look at Nazi Germany, for example. They committed arguably the worst, worst war crimes and, 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 and crimes against humanity, you know, specifically against the Jewish people here, right? So that's, it's relevant. And, you know, for it, they were occupied. They were partitioned, and they, I think, till today they still pay reparations. But today, you know, it's kind of you know, it's kind of funny, yeah. is that um, a lot of people make the point that, and this is really interesting. Yeah, the the Germany still play pays reparations, and the you can't figure out like the individual like who to really pay the reparations to even though, you know, there's Holocaust survivors everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So you think like the, what you would want to do is that you'd want to pay out the reparations to, you know, the individual Holocaust survivors, like who live in Brooklyn now or live in Russia now mm-hmm. or live in England or, or Israel, you know, wherever mm-hmm. they live. But I guess that's really too hard to figure out. So their reparations are just paid to the state of Israel. Right. Right. That doesn't sound right. Well, listen, I mean, but the- and but but here's what the other here's the point you're going to hear. Mm-hmm. That Germany is now partic- they they're again participating on ethnic cleansing oh, Jesus. because they're paying. Yeah, it's like they're they're fucked. But I mean, look, the point of me bringing up Germany is that today they're reunified. You know, they're they're accepted back into the international community as a nation state. You know, they're celebrated even. You know, and 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 are prosperous and and they're strong defenders of the human rights across the world except in this case uh the fact that they are still paying this reparations money to israel who is now committing their own set of atrocities um but the point though is that in the span of what like 80 years or, or so even shorter than that because you, you want to talk about the reunification of germany as the point where they like cease to be you know get their the, the finger pointed at them all the time you know even they don't share this kind of oppression or guilt or blame 
and they did the Holocaust. And most people in the world today, you know, with with few exceptions, would view Germany as a as a good country, as a positive force for the world today. That's not how people look at or sympathize with the Palestinians. On the other hand, you know, they still to this day live under occupation. They're still subjected to some of the some pretty heinous crimes against humanity. Um, but you know, the, the question always is like, all right, but they started it. They didn't accept the 1947, you know, uh, uh, partition plan. They, they started all the wars and, and, and they were the reasons why, you know, Israel had to defend itself. And, and it's not just the Palestinians, it's all the Jordans, the Jordanians jumped in, the, the Syrians jumped in, the Egyptians jumped in, you know, yes, officially the Arabs did start the war. And I think it was is multiple Arab, Arab nations which joined in the fight and they lost, which is nuts. Um, to, to, you know, to the Israeli military's credit, they, they fucked them up. But I think it's so complicated to totally levy the blame against the Palestinian Arabs here, or even the, the neighboring countries who joined in this war. You know, the, the official Israeli position on this war was that it was a war of independence. They were attacked by the Arabs, and they hated them for no other reason other than the fact that they existed. The truth is much more nuanced. Were there... Were there Arabs who wanted to kill, you know, Israelis or, or, or just stop the new state of Israel from, from being a thing? Yes, absolutely. Most definitely. And that's fucked up in and of itself. But it wasn't. But I, it, you understand why they didn't want the state to create because the state was an exclusionary state. Right, and it wasn't like it was something that was like inherent anti semitic Like the way that the Israeli narrative now is that they did it because they hate Jews. Right. Like that's the, that's like the one side hates Jews and they don't think that Jews have the right to exist right. because they're crazy fanatic Muslims. Mm-hmm. That's not the story. The story is that I mean, the state that maybe. was created some of them was maybe. an exclusionary state. <laughs> some of them maybe but, were but anti-Semitic, right? Some but of them maybe sure. were. Yeah, there's fucking anti-Semites in every crowd. But right. the majority that wasn't exactly. like we hate Moses. Like <laughs> we're going to go kill these people. Yeah, dude, and it was they want to create a state that makes us second class citizens. Right. And they're staking land, and they're taking land, and they're taking land. Like, what are we supposed to do? Right. I mean, setting, like, setting aside like that the, anger that they had for the partition plan, which they felt was unjust in the first place, they were they were also, and this is something that almost nobody ever talks about, especially this gets under my skin when I hear the, you know, the, the standard Israeli line about, you know, this was totally a defensive war of independence. You know, you got to read the history on this one. It's... They were subjected to quite a bit of aggression even before the new state of Israel was started. You know, so again, Sam Hawadi, Bitter Harvest. So Menahem Begin, that's the the um, sixth prime minister, uh, says, In Jerusalem, as elsewhere, we were the first to pass from the defensive to the offensive. Arabs began to flee in terror. Haganah was carrying out successful attacks on other fronts, while all the Jewish forces proceeded to advance through Haifa like a knife through butter. Um, Hawadi continues on by saying, this is not the quote anymore, but he, he's saying that the Israelis alleged that the war began with the entry of the Arab armies into, the Pal- into Palestine after the 15th of May in 1948. But what, was, but, but what he's arguing is that this is actually the second phase of the war and that they were uh, the, this argument ignores the massacres, the expulsions, and the dispossessions which took place before, uh, you know, the the invasion, um, which obviously was the catalyst for the invasion. Remember my quote from a, from the above: the 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 leaders of the state of Israel might have signed on to the nineteen forty seven partition uh, partition, but they never had an intention to keep it that way. And by the sixth prime minister's own words, Israel was the first to go on the offensive. Let's talk about some atrocities here, because and, and this can kind of help us spill and, into the human I, rights yeah, watch. And I'm, I'm very glad that you brought this up, and, and I know that we're going to go over uh, some of these specific examples, mm-hmm. but I just want to, you know, it, Benjamin Netanyahu, what he has been doing lately, and it kind of shows you how things have changed, and we could maybe talk about this a little bit later. Um, he's sharing Prager U. <laughs> And he's sharing Prager View, Prager U videos. Obviously, when you're sharing a Prager U video, you're only talking to the American right. right. You're not talking to the American left. Right. 
But this the, Dennis Prager has this video where, you know, oh, I'm Dennis Prager, and what happened was that the Jews just signed a, a bit, their independence in 1948, mm-hmm. and all the Arab countries decided to attack them. For no reason at all. Uh, uh, for no reason. He doesn't talk about the fact that, you know, over the past, like, eight months prior, there was a war going on, and there was, you know, two days before... Um, on May 13th, you know, May 15th is the, you know, the day they sign their right. constitution mm-hmm. or not. They don't have a constitution. They sign like their papers. That's an important point, um, too, that I'd like to talk about later, but continue. But they, um, Jaffa was ethnically cleansed. Mm-hmm. Jaffa was the was the major city there for, for a very long time. And th- that, everyone fleed. <laughs> they left. They they, they they decided to leave. Why did they leave? Well, because paramilitary groups were going and, you know, either killing people or threatening them to let's, leave. Let's talk, about, let's talk about those. So uh, I want to talk about the first. The Urguts and her. Yeah. All right. Let's, Let, let's, get, let's get into Urguts. a bunch of them because I, I can rapid fire some of these. So there was this uh, atrocity called the Der Yassin Massacre of Palestinians by Jewish soldiers. There's this Israeli author, who uh, Sima Flappin, who wrote in uh, the book The Birth of Israel. Um, so, uh, it was written that the, for, for the entire day on April 9th, 1948, uh, Irgun and Lehi soldiers carried out the slaughter in a cold and premeditated fashion. The attackers lined men, women, and children up against the walls and shot them. The ruthlessness of the attack on Darius and shock Jewish and world opinion alike drove fear and panic in the Arab population and led to the fight, the flight of unarmed civilians from their homes all over the country. Here's another bit. Uh, this is from Norman Finkelstein, who, by the way, I listened to that entire uh, thing that you sent me, Henry, and it was great. Um, but Norman Finkelstein's book, uh, Image and Reality of the Israel-Palestine Conflict. So he writes, By 1948, the Jew was not only able to defend himself, but to commit massive atrocities as well. Indeed, according to the former director of the Israeli Army Archives, in almost every village occupied by, the, by us during the War of the Independence— Acts were committed, which were defined as war crimes, such as murders, massacres, and rapes. Uri Milstein, the authoritative Israeli military historian of 1948 war, uh, goes one step further, maintaining that every skirmish ended in a massacre of Arabs. So every con- so every conflict here ended up with hundreds, maybe thousands of Arabs dead. Here's another one. So this is Benny Morris. He writes the book, uh, The Birth of the Palestinian Refugee Problem. This was in 47 and 49. So he wrote, Ben-Gurion, again, remember, he's the first, he's the George Washington of Israel. Ben-Gurion clearly wanted as few Arabs as possible to remain in the Jewish state. He always hoped to see them flee, but no general expulsion policy was ever enunciated, and Ben-Gurion always refrained from issuing clear or written expulsion orders. He preferred that his generals understand, quote-unquote, what he wanted done. He wished to avoid going down in history as the great expeller, and he did not want the Israeli government to be implicated in a morally questionable policy. But while there was no expulsion policy, the July and October 1948 offensives were characterized by far more expulsions and indeed brutally towards Arab civilians than the first half of the war. And so this question about, you know, what comes up a lot in these arguments is that, well, you know, during the War of Independence, the Arabs left and they left and they did. They voluntarily left during (laughs) during the war. Voluntarily. It's not voluntarily if you're running in terror. Uh, You know what I mean? I'd honestly ask anyone who makes that claim. Yeah, I'm voluntarily choosing not not to die. To be, you know, die. So anyone who's making this claim needs to seriously examine what they mean by voluntary. So how about this? The BBC... Uh, monitored all of the Midi- Middle Eastern broadcasts throughout 1948, and and they recorded it quite a bit. And there was also companion ones by the United by the U.S. Uh, who were also monitoring all of the uh, communications. And all of this can be seen in the the British Museum. Um, there was not a single order or appeal or even a suggestion about uh, evacuating from Palestine from any Arab radio station inside or outside of Palestine in 1948. I'm going to repeat that again. Nobody was telling the Palestinians to leave. As a matter of fact, 
there were a lot of orders inside of Palestine over the radio um, to stay. Like they said, stay put, don't leave. So, but the, the fact of the matter remains that they did leave. A lot of people left. And <laughs> like, if you want to, if you want to be literal about it, you know, if a foreign aggressor is murdering people in your town and you decide to flee for your life before you get killed, is that really voluntary? Right? If literally, yeah, sure, it might be voluntary that you left. No one forced you to do that, but it's the kind it's just a ridiculous statement. It's a ridiculous argument to make in support of the annexation once, of that land. Once there's force, once there's a the threat of force, what you're doing is not voluntary. Right. You know, if I say, "Hey, if I put a gun to your head and I say, give me your money you're not voluntarily giving me your money yeah but you're you know the argument your money because the argument that they you. make is i'm not pointing the gun at your head i'm pointing the gun at your neighbor's head and you just decided to leave yeah well i don't think that's how that's not how it works let's just let's <laughs> yeah. who are we kidding like who are we kidding let's 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 just call a spade a spade yeah. right now they were ethnically cleansed. Right. There's no other way to say it. They were ethnically cleansed in some case genocide and again i, I mean genocide is a tough word to use and like yeah. It's a lot of There's a lot of baggage behind that. Uh, yeah. It's a lot of baggage with that because did they cuz when you think of genocide we think of Nazi Germany right. systematically going and shooting, you know, going through rows of Jews and shooting them in the head. Gas chambers, the whole them in works, the mass right. mm-hmm. and death camps mm-hmm. and all that stuff and like that's usually what we think of genocide but I I don't know. Like what is it's it's in some cases, committing a war atrocities and killing people right. at the very mm-hmm. least. I don't and know. And remember, how. remember, uh, if this is, again, something that really frustrates me with the Israeli talking points on this particular issue is because they're saying that they were being attacked and they had to defend themselves and everyone who left, left voluntarily. You know, we're not talking about, we're talking about people here. We're not talking about a state being evicted. We're not talking about a state you know, being fought off. We're talking about families. We're talking about women, children, old people, everyone, not just the soldiers or the men that were fighting to, def- to defend themselves, or even even the forces whose aims were to destroy the Palestinian state. We're not even talking about them. We're talking about regular human beings who just happened to live there and got caught up in all this nonsense who had nothing to fucking do with it. And people fled, fled for their lives, and they were never permitted to return, even to this day, over 700,000 of them. And, you know, let's just say, you know, there's no such thing as a Palestinian. It's still going people. Back to people who point, live there. Was, Who cares I, about when, what they're called? Like, who, like, yeah, like, going back to the, you know, the claim, like, there's no such thing as a Palestinian people. Mm-hmm. They're just people who migrated there. There was no consciousness of a Palestinian until after the state of Israel was created, all that. You know, even if you gr- you're granted that premise, there are still people who are living there. You know, just because... They don't have like a nation. Like there's this meme going on right now. That's you know it always it always it's a very pro-Israel boomer meme, mm-hmm. and it's basically if you're pro-Palestine, ask yourself what was the Palestinian currency, what was the Palestinian president's name, mm-hmm. you know what was the pat like name, all this kind of stuff that you know re- resemble you know what's Palestinian Palestine's Independence Day right. like you know saying that oh yeah they were a nation state. Yeah. So what? Like. Yeah. Again, it's, there's still it's people. ignoring it's ignoring the people for for Who like cares? a nation. We're not talking about the nation. We're talking about the people that live there, right? It, it wasn't right when you know people are like also bring up well, well, look what America did. You know. I mean, yeah, yeah it wasn't right. Yeah, like, that exactly. Wasn't, Same shit. We'll we don't. Be equally we critical agreed. about that too. We have agreed that what the United States did as far as forcibly moving Indians. Out west, out west, out west, out west, out west. Pushing them out until now there are only small systems. reservations across the country. Is wrong. Yeah, it's, it's like, fucked we, up. We've agreed. And there could have been a United States of America with, without doing right. that. Like there could have been the same country that we have right now without treating treating Native Americans so terribly. Correct. Like it didn't have to be violent nope. towards them. No. Nope. Well, they were violent savages. Don't give me that Some shit. tribes fucking bullshit. more violent than others, but there could have been a way around making mass groups of people. There's plenty. There were plenty of examples West. of native and you know settler uh, populations that coexisted and and thrived with one another through trade and and, and the like. 
there are pl- hey the first the first people who came to this country the first major colonies um the croatoan colony mm-hmm. you, you know that that story that you learn in history class is like a mystery they um you know they disappeared like one on their resupply trip like the ships that came to resupply the colony um they didn't see you know they were gone and they just said uh crow i think it was crow towing um archaeological digs uh, have discovered that they just you know they weren't massacred or anything they just they just assimilated into the indian cultures right you know, like they just went and you know started living with the indians and you know and that was that became part of their society and that was mm-hmm. that um but yeah I mean, you get a crazy horse situation and, you know, you kind of look a crazy horse horse custard and, and we're taught in the United States now in our history books to side with crazy horse over custard. Like you're always taught in history, like at least history that I mm-hmm. grew up with that custard was evil. Right. Like did, were you bad, taught that yeah, General absolutely. Custer is yeah, evil? He was fucked up. In American culture, you're taught that General Custer was an evil man. I mean, we who, were taught that in The Last Samurai with uh, with Tom Cruise. General Custer was yeah. fucked up. <laughs> General Custer is incru- and, and Crazy Horse is venerated in American society. Right. You know, wasn't even Trump saying like let's make a you know, make a Crazy Horse statue or something like that or I actually that's a statue. Whatever. There's a Crazy court. Horse thing in North, <laughs> South Dakota already, I'm pretty sure, right? Isn't there like a big monument for Crazy I'm Horse? Sh- I'm certain. I'm certain, yeah. Yeah. Well, Crazy Horse is um venerated um because, you know, he resisted. And you know, he killed American soldier soldier. But he, you know, seen as an act of courage. Right. Um, all right. Okay. I want to talk about How one much? last thing before we jump into the Human Rights Watch report, because that's going to be super uh, important. It's just about, you know, the negotiations, negotiations that came after the 1948 to 1949 rules, uh, wars. So obviously, directly following the war for independence, you know, Israel claimed a shit ton of land, you know, uh, to the victor go the spoils, of course. And you know, the, but the question always remained, you know, the, uh, on the Palestinian right of return, right? Um, Israelis will, will always, you know, say that, well, you know, we ended up giving the land back. You know, we gave all the, you know, we gave the Sinai back. We gave, we gave, we gave it all back and you know, we didn't keep it forever. We just, we were just defending ourselves and we needed to occupy it for the moment. But the question to this day still is on the Palestinian right of return, because like I said, 700,000 people fled they had to leave and they're not allowed to return and the state of israel i want to be very clear about this not the israeli people but the state of israel rejects their ability to return and i think that they rightfully expect the the palestinians rightfully expect to be able to come home and to this day they're not allowed to come back and and this has been a sticking point in every negotiation since the the 48, 49 wars. Here's a, here's a quote here. Uh, Sima Flapan, we, we, we talked about this one, the birth of Israel. Um, so it says, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, and the Palestinians were trying to save by negotiations what they had lost in the war. And so a Palestinian state alongside Israel. That's what they wanted. Israel, however, preferred a tenuous armistice, that, uh, armistice agreement to a definite peace that would involve territorial concessions and the repatriation of even a token number of refugees, the refusal to recognize Palestinians' right to self-determination and statehood proved over the years to be the main source of turbulent violence, bloodshed that came to pass. You know, so we, 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 could, we can keep going for another several hours and we can talk about the 67 war, we can talk about all the intifadas, we can talk about Hamas, we can talk about you know, uh, bombings and terrorism and all this other shit. But in, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, and I think probably a lot of people will agree with me, is that all of these conflicts seem to be an echo of the same history that we've already discussed. It's always going to come back to this land issue, and it's always going to come back to whether or not Palestinians get to come back home and whether or not Israel is allowed to exist as it as it currently is. And this is where the conflict stems from. And, and where we go now, you know, is to talk about the reality on the ground as it is today. You know, to give some extra context for the very modern and, and relevant current events that are happening now um, as we speak. Prior to the madness that was going on, and um, I just want to mention that I don't, I think we should have mentioned that we are recording this podcast on Saturday, 
twenty uh, second, I believe. Mm-hmm. So there has been a ceasefire. Um, thank thank God there's been a ceasefire. Yeah. But to, to add fuel or to uh, help conceptual uh, to put this in context, there was a Human Rights Watch report that was released late April, and this Human Rights Report was called um, A Threshold Crossed Israeli Authorities in the Crimes of Apartheid and Persecution. Human Rights Watch is the most vanilla human rights NGO on the planet. Um, Most of their members are center-left. They're New York Times readers. Um, They're very far from, like, pro-Palestinian, like, left-wing activists. And I'm going to read some of these, some of their findings, because what they have found is uh, stunning that it's on paper. I'll just be completely honest, but I'm going to read some of this and I guess feel free to interject. Sure. Um, About 6.8 million Jewish Israelis and 6.8 million Palestinians live today between the Mediterranean Sea and Jordan River an area encompassing Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory, the OPT, the latter made up of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip. Throughout most of this area, Israel is the sole governing power. In this remainder, it exercises primary authority alongside limited Palestinian self-rule. Across these areas, and in most aspects of life, Israeli authorities methodically privilege Jewish Israelis and discriminate against Palestinians. Laws, policies, and statements by leading Israeli officials make plain that the objective of maintaining Jewish-Israeli control over the demographics, political power, and land has long guided government policy. In pursuit of this goal, authorities have dispossessed, confined, forcibly separated, and subjugated Palestinians by virtue of their identity to varying degrees of intensity. In certain areas, as described in this report, these deprivations are so severe that they amount to the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. Heavy shit. Crimes against humanity (sighs) is what Human Rights Watch has labeled what Israel is doing to the occupied territories. Crimes against humanity. What the crime what the definition they use, crimes against humanity stand among the most odious crimes in international law. Crimes against humanity consist of specific criminal acts committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack or acts committed pursuant to a state or organizational policy directed against a civilian population. And then this thing goes on to claim that Israel's practicing apartheid. Now, New York Times, the way that it's always been kind of framed like as of late, has always been, oh, Israel might be on the way to apartheid. Or it's but no like one has ever apartheid. Realized. A like <laughs> apartheid. This human rights report, and this is not, it's center left, so it's kind of not, obviously not a right wing organization, but it is not like, you know, code pink. This is, this is a center left New York Times audience, probably read the New Yorker, it's calling Israel an apartheid state. And, and I want to, so, I want to un- underscore this because this particular organization is fairly well respected and and when we're when it's not talking about the situation in Israel Palestine people from across the spectrum you know left right and center view their you know uh their work as as largely good and accurate and not only this isn't this is not the only NGO Betselem the leading Israeli human rights organization so the Israeli human rights organization basically came out with the same report saying the same thing, concluding. The only difference is is that they call it de facto apartheid instead of calling it apartheid. That's the only difference in the language, but they came up with the same conclusion. So let's read this. The crime of apartheid under the Apartheid Convention in Rome Statute consists of three primary elements, 
an intent to maintain a system of domination by one racial group over another, systematic oppression by one racial group over another, and one or more inhumane acts as defined carried out in a, on a widespread or systematic basis pursuant to those policies. Among the hu- inhuman acts identified in either the Convention of the Rome Statute or for our forcible transfer, expiration of landed property, creation of separate reserves and ghettos, and denial of, of the right to leave and to return to their country and right to a nationality. As we were saying before, which is one of the key uh, gripes. Right, the right to return. And it goes on. To sustain Jewish-Israeli control, Israeli authorities have adopted policies aimed at mitigating what they have openly described as a demographic threat that Palestinians pose. We have talked about this in other podcasts that Benjamin Netanyahu and other Israeli leaders openly talk about preserving Jewish majorities. Right. And right now— This is not something that's secret. It's open, very open, that they're always saying, how do we maintain our Jewish majority? And and today, that's a big problem for them because the state of Israel, you know, if you include even West Bank and Gaza, you know, just lump it all together as one thing. It's about 12 million in population, and it's like half-half Israeli Arab. And that's a problem, especially when you consider that the the specific zones where— the Palestinians are living is very small in comparison to the um, to the the land area that the Israelis occupy. So let's go on. Those policies include limiting the population and political power of Palest- Palestinians, uh, granting the right to vote only to Palestinians who live within the borders of Israel as they existed from forty eight to sixty seven, and limiting the ability of Palestinians to move to. Israel from the OPT and from anywhere else to Israel or the OPT. Other step, steps are taken to ensure Jewish domination, including a state policy of separation of Palestinians between West Bank and Gaza, which prevents the movement of people and goods within the OPT and Judaization of areas with significant Palestinian populations, including Jerusalem, as well as uh, Galilee and the Negev in Israel. The policy, which aims to maximize Jewish-Israeli control over land, concentrates the majority of Palestinians who live outside Israeli, is, Israel's major predominantly Jewish cities into dense, underserved enclaves and restricts their access to land and housing while nurturing the growth of nearby Jewish communities. And then here's what, I mean, it goes on. So I want to just read this last one um, statement, or I mean, I, we can go through the entire, it's 200 pages long. Um this is on its highlight of, of East Jerusalem. In annexed East Jerusalem, which is Israel considers part of its so, uh, sovereign territory but remains occupied territory under international law, Israel provides the vast majority of the hundreds of thousands of, Pal- of Palestinians living there with a legal status that weakens their residency rights by conditioning them on the individual connections to the city. Among other factors, this level of discrimination amounts to systematic oppression. Let's break that up because that's important. What what they're saying there is that in order for you to have any kind of status of and, and, and ability to live in East Jerusalem, you have to literally be there. You cannot leave. Otherwise, you lose that. Yeah, basically, you're, you're, in a lot of like this, this shit going on on Sheikh uh, Jarrah, Jarrah. Mm-hmm. Sheikh Jarrah has to do with like these really weird land rules that are like, hey, you happen to live on like this side of the code, and and like now, therefore, this wasn't bought by some uh, Jewish organization. Like, it's super weird and complicated, and just obviously being used to manipulate, being manipulated to evict people from their homes so they can just move in settlers Mm -hmm. and just keep on moving moving and moving um i don't know how much more do you want to go through i have some other quotes i've transferred out i think we've got the point across if you if there's anything else that you want me to read um i mean i think i think you again this this human rights report is 200 pages long and and i think Anyone who has, you know, the the time to even read portions of it, will will be absolutely stunned uh, by what they read, and and fill fill in the blanks with your imagination here. You know, we we can't sit here and read it all to you, 
but it it's just sad it's just really sad it, and i want to just add like what this means now this is stuff that we all know come on like, let's just be serious everyone who's been following this conflict knew that this this stuff was going on like everyone it's been documented but what is interesting is that it was put on paper mm-hmm. and that human rights watch which has a large jewish donorship which is many of its members are jewish were confident enough to put this report out that delegitimizes the state of Israel, because that's what this does. It delegitimizes the state of Israel as a Jewish state. You have to wonder how much has changed or measure how much has changed since 2014 or since 2011, Mm -hmm. since the past 10 years, and how the left, American center left now views Israel as a state. And what I think is that this is the beginning of the end of the Zionist project. I think this is the big beginning of the end. The fact that the, it looks like the American left is turning on this state. And I think there's a combination of a lot of things, the reason why. I think a lot of it has to do with Donald Trump. Um, You know, kind of the Israeli flag almost being like a symbol of the Trump movement in a lot of ways, Um, just because of how blatantly pro-Israel and and like the personal relationship between Donald Trump and Benjamin Netanyahu. A lot of left wingers find Benjamin Netanyahu absolutely repulsive. Um, I'm not a I am not a left winger and I find him pretty gross and repulsive. Um, It is. And then there's the imagery of of Jewish na- like extremists celebrating a fire at the Temple Mount. I mean, yeah, that that, that was a shocking imagery. Yeah, that was a that's moment going where, where the world. I was sitting there watching that with my girlfriend, and 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 she's not again just like your girlfriend, not hip to this you know situation, and and we're watching it together, and. You know, there, this was during the Jerusalem Day, which is their celebration for the, you know, 1948 um, uh, independence uh, uh, and, and, and claiming uh, Jerusalem as their capital. And and you just see all these flags waving and they're all dancing and happy and, and watching at, you know, on the top of the Temple Mount, a tree that's burning down. And, and at first I thought it was the Al-Aqsa Mosque and I was like, oh, shit. Uh, you know, Al-Aqsa Mosque is on fire and they're celebrating it. Turned out the beat it was just a tree, but the, the tree burning itself was kind of symbolic. It's in the compound. Right, it's in, it's the, in compound, the compound. And, it's, and it was symbolic of, of the thing, that the fact that they were celebrating, you know, the, the destruction, if you will, you know, of this and their victory. It was just gross, honestly. It, 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 it's, just, it's such such shocking imagery now add the violence in Gaza where you just scroll through, you type in, you, if you look at the hashtag and just follow like Palestine, if you scroll through the hashtag, you're going to, within a 30 seconds, you're going to see a picture of a charred child, like a child that's charred, mm. like that's missing his head. Putting all that together, it's, I think the world is, becoming um um zionism as it is today um kit is not compatible look with, and, and with I, I, I think world. it's important like that's i think that's what we're coming to like it's just not compatible anymore it's not compatible and the key that what things that are major signs and i don't know maybe we could continue this on on patreon because i have a lot to say about this but I think one of the key things that was really telling about even how the U.S. feels about this is that Joe, the Biden administration seems to not be happy with them. And Biden's a really hardcore. He's been a very hardcore Zionist throughout his entire career. But the fact that Anthony Blinken, who is Jewish himself, Mm -hmm. um, he... When they came to him and after they blew up the Al Jazeera building and they asked him about it, like, what do you think about the, you know, uh, 
the Israeli Someone asked him a question: right? Is like was was the was the uh, Al Jazeera AP building was that um, Hamas intelligence? Is Israel's cl- claiming that that was Hamas? And he's like, I didn't see anything like that. I didn't see I didn't see any evidence of of that being Hamas. That told that what I saw was that the Biden administration says you're on your own on this one. This is this is your problem. You do you do what you have to do politically. We'll you know give you the money. We'll we'll sign off on it. Don't massacre a bunch of people. Don't kill a bunch of people. Um, do not have a two. Do not at, do not make this 2014 protect the Operation Protective Edge where thousands of people were slaughtered. Keep the death count low, and um, you know that this this isn't they they were not you can tell they were not happy about that and um now israel is been especially benjamin Netanyahu, is in a very very bad spot politically because now the last thing they wanted was there to be some like during a ceasefire to be some ep- some great celebration in in gaza in the west bank and you know and you know uh greater palestine you know that celebrating the ceasefire like they had their victory Mm -hmm. because that's what's going on right now because benjamin (laughs) Netanyahu has to go on tv and address the public and say yeah like we killed 200 terrorists they didn't kill 200 terrorists they killed about 60 children another you know a bunch of elderly people uh they more i think more children and maybe about a dozen like they're all hamas right no it is looks really damning and it seems like a lot of this was due to Benjamin Netanyahu's ele- this election that seems like it's been going on for about five years, and the fact that, um, it, hmm, help me complete my thought right there. What was I going to say? I mean, I, I think election. The, the, the fact that we're at this point right now, it, it both sides are. Oh are, yeah, are gonna be- I know what I was going to say. The Black Lives Matter movement. Mm. So I think that last year with with Black Lives Matter, you have all these people who like got really engaged in activism. It's been a year now. BLM has kind of died down. There's not really active protest anymore. And now they're presented, now a lot of activist-minded people are presented with a new thing to address and addressing an apartheid state is uh you know how can you not within the context of the black lives matter movement right if they share everyone's going to be extra yeah. sensitive about racial supremacy mm-hmm. then you're kind of forced to deal with this yeah, we already had this and national think, conversation about about yeah. you know inequality between between races we already had this national conversation mm-hmm. and it was in many cases violent right so we and and people will fall on either side of this issue, but the the general point is we already talked about this, and so when we bring up this this new instance and it happens to be abroad and it happens to be with you know Israelis and Palestinians, it evokes the same conversation that we just talked we just talked about this, you know, and it, and it becomes and very easy saying. for those supporters of BLM to kind of um, sympathize with the Palestinians in this respect because, I mean, they're not wrong. It shares a lot of. Shares a lot of the same thing, except you know now we're talking about it's worse. Yeah, it's worse because people there's they're not be, there's black people, people in this be, country aren't being you know subjected to an open air prison. Black people in this country aren't being airstriked. You know, yes, their their plight is fucked up in this country for sure, without a doubt. But here's an example of a a clearly and openly oppressive regime. You know. Uh, committing what human rights organizations are are now amounting openly to a apartheid system, to war crimes, to, to crimes against humanity. Yeah. And, and another thing is that I want to talk about some of the military stuff. I want to talk about Gaza a little bit deeper. Hell yeah. But we'll end up going on because there were some real interesting things that I've observed um, with that whole campaign. Um, but another key thing, Chuck Schumer. He is Captain Democratic Zionist, like a guy who will, when he's talking to an Orthodox Jewish community, he will change his rhetoric and he'll sound like Donald Trump. Like he'll sound like um, very hardcore. Mm-hmm. 
he didn't say a goddamn word over the past two weeks. Yep. And I was listening to this Norman Finkelstein interview, mm-hmm. the one I had sent you, and he yeah. said something to the effect of, in the 1970s, if there was Israel under attack, there would have been a million Jews in Brooklyn marching. Mm-hmm. Quite the contrary. We the saw... big marches were all pro-Palestinian exactly. marches in exactly. Brooklyn, mm-hmm. in Bay Ridge. Yep. So it really seems that this is going to be a, a topic that stays around and just not brushed under the under the uh, the rug, and that there is going to be some serious um, evaluation of how uh, we deal with you know the blatant discrimination of Palestinians um, in Israel. All right, let's wrap this up. But I want to let's let, let's continue. Let's continue this on Patreon. I want to talk about uh, Gaza a little bit deeper because sure. um, there was. I want to talk more about some of the military stuff. Um, and I think that will be that will be interesting because um, I've I've noticed some real interesting things compared to uh, that of 2014, and um, I think it would be an interesting conversation. Um, but thank you guys for listening to another episode of Bro History. I know this one was probably going to be a long one, so hoping if you if you guys stuck with us for. Um, However long well, it was. looks like we're at two for over two hours, maybe more. Um, not sure what a will, final podcast will look like, but thank you so much. Rate and review the podcast if you enjoyed it. Um, and let us know if you want us to continue talking about Israel, Palestine. Um, you know, we will, we've been doing, we were in the middle of a series on Russia. Um, but I mean, this is something that we are obviously, um, you know, would put more content on. And if it, if the demand was there and it certainly seems like it could be, so let us know, rate and review the podcast. That would be a good way to communicate it. Hey, keep on doing more Israeli podcast, uh, Israel Palestine podcast, five stars. Um, and then uh, obviously email us, hit us up, hit us up on Twitter. Um, also, um, if you want to support us, get extra content, um, join our Slack community. You can join us on Patreon uh, slash Bro History. You can support us for just a dollar a month. So I'll put the link there and. Um, I will also put uh, the sources that we use for this podcast as well um, in the description. Um, A very good website, if you are interested in learning more, um, is ifamericanew.org. So I would check that out. Um, And then um, anything else to say? No. Thanks for sticking around. All right. Peace, everyone. 